All right, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Flutter London and Flutter Berlin. We've Hello, got a everyone. great lineup for you guys tonight, man. Excellent lineup. So we've got Dominic leading in tonight. I'll let Sally quickly explain what he's going to be talking about. Yeah, basically, Dominic is going to give you some insights about how we how he handles the internalization because you know in Flutter apps, this is one of the biggest topics that everybody's trying to tackle. And yeah, he will be giving us like tips and tricks on how you can actually achieve it. And yeah, afterwards we will have Remy. Let's get back to you, George. <laughs> yeah, and so Remy's going to be talking to us about a new library he's going to be uh, introducing, something that was announced or spoken in detail about last year at uh, Google I.O. So he's going to be talking about how he's reinvented the provider library. And then after that, we're going to go back to Berlin. Exactly. We will have Katerina with us from Flutter Zurich, and she will explain us about, she will talk to us about Block, which is the uh, most, let's say, it's the bad kid in the club, but if you have <laughs> the good guidance, I'm sure that you will have it after this talk. And she'll explain to us, like, what is Block, what are the COVID and, like, hard points, and how you can actually tackle those with her talk. And with the last one, we will have Roddy with us. And Roddy is going to be talking to us about his uh, how to build a, an adaptive UI in Flutter. Probably be mentioning some of his other libraries as well, but he's going to be delving into the cross-platform framework, uh, how there's, there's new problems, because obviously we're designing for, for native uh, web as well as uh, mobile. So there's quite a few things we need to think about now when building things in Flutter. So like, uh, I think, what is it? We're going to be starting in about 10 minutes. So uh, if you want to start asking some questions in the top chat, we'll jot them down for later on. So uh, if you look at the meetup pages, uh, either Flutter Berlin or the Flutter London one, you can see our, our schedule. Obviously, these are just rough times, but we've got a good few hours worth of entertainment for you. So I think Dominic's going to be starting in about uh, 15 minutes, maybe. Yeah, something like 10, 15 minutes. So yeah. that should be quite good. So yeah, feel free to start asking some questions. We'll answer what we can. Um, yeah. So, yeah, also um, you can find the schedule in the description below in the YouTube channel as well. So just check it out. And like maybe along the way, we can also introduce ourselves, George, like who we are and what do we do actually. <laughs> uh, do you want to go first? Because you brought the, <clears throat> actually, you are the architect of this event, so you should go oh, first. Uh, thank you. Such an honor. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically, the way this has started is, uh, well, Flutter London's been around for roughly two years. And uh, um, obviously, there's a lot of demand for Flutter. And like we, we weren't sure how we should actually... Uh, like we were talking about this in the past, weren't we, Sully, on actually arranging this? So oddly yeah. enough, it actually just happened that I planned one event, you planned one event, and we noticed that it was all the same. So that's how, on the same time and everything. So we thought, why not give people this epic uh, line, yeah. <laughs> really? Especially when we're all celebrating lockdown. You know, I'm sorry for people if they've got any, um, you know, bad situations at home or anything. But, you know, while the other ones... Uh, 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 keeping busy at work. Let's give them something to to occupy their minds when they are doing Flutter. Yeah, I mean, like for me, uh, especially having this lineup was one of the uh, biggest, let's say, kismet, let's say, because we have almost all the topics that everybody is talking about, so they can learn. I'm sure that yeah. they can learn a lot of stuff during this day. It's like a tiny conference sort of thing. Mini and <laughs> exactly. And we have like really great professionals, a GD with us. And like we have like the creator of one of the biggest libraries of Flutter World. So it's it's really exciting to be a part of this event. It is. We've got some excellent speakers, really, really, really interesting uh, ahead. So. Let's have a look at what questions we've got. What are the differences between React Native and Flutter? What does Flutter do better than React Native? Well, we don't use JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing. Like, uh, the, the obviously, you know, Flutter's been optimized uh, to run inside Skia and to run inside 
uh, its own uh, engine rather than using uh, the cross-platform. So obviously we can talk to the uh, all the services and APIs of the native uh, host uh, operating system. But, you know, the main thing is, is like, uh, we're actually running inside our own engine. So everything is drawn natively. And that's one of the, the advantages, I would say. The language is quite nice as well. We don't have to think about doing any JavaScript. We've got strongly typed language. Um, I don't know, Sally, if you've got anything you can add to this. I mean, like, I think the biggest advantage is having control over all the pixels that you have, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you just, I mean, you have control over all the pixels. You ask for a cameras and you can do anything with it. But at the same time, you have direct access to device specific things. So you can actually communicate with native code. Like, by native, what I mean is like Kotlin or Swift, like respectively Android and iOS. So you are not losing anything from the native side. But at the same time, you like what you have above like everything else is you don't have any bridges you don't have any limits you have everything on your side on your limits so you, it, it's like you may, your imagination is your limit about this yeah we shouldn't of course like it. it is compiled to native as well so it actually compiles down to uh, native arm code on a mobile device which is a huge sp uh, speed advantage as well exactly like especially with the last release not just uh, that but mm. also from the a uh, perspective of the development exactly like metal on iOS is like quite amazing yeah but yeah like obviously react native is a great platform as well like there is no this is best the other one is a terrible sort of situation but like if you think about it there is also some um uh, like there's a lot of advantages using on flutter but you need to decide it on yourself mm -hmm. So uh, Abisex has been asking how to, where is it now? Well, actually, we should ask this one. How do you add an image to the app bar? Well, you would uh, just literally, uh, where you say child, I think you just say image, don't you? Yeah, I mean, like, that's what, like, I think in the app bar there was title, but in, even in the title, you can add any widget that you want. But what you can have is, uh, in, you can also create your own uh, app bar as well. So in the app bar, it comes from like preferred height widget or something like this. I don't remember it. So you can actually extend it and create your own app bar with whatever you want. Uh, you can have an image in it. You can have even another app in it because at the end it's a widget. So it's totally up to you. You can have the custom uh, approach as well. I'm just scrolling through the list. Okay, will we have recorded video? I mean, like, please subscribe to the Flutter Community YouTube channel right now because <laughs> you may find the recordings of these uh, also on Flutter London as well, right? Flutter London's YouTube channel as well. That's right, yes. Yes, we have a, our own YouTube channel. As you can see, we've been uploading most of our presentations from the previous years. So uh, they're all available now. Right, what time is it now? Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully Dominic will be able to join us in a few moments. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Sorry, guys. We're also reading uh, the yeah. questions that are coming up on the screen. So like, it's yeah. quite difficult. As you can see, there's quite a few coming up. Uh, what are your reasons to develop in Flutter? Well, the enjoyment, really. It's speed, yeah. hot reload. <laughs> I mean, like to be able to, you, you, if you've built anything inside uh, iOS or for iOS or for Android, then the compile times, you know, we've all seen the meme where you've got the people sword fighting because the, the, the app is compiling. Well, this is literally how it is sometimes. So with Flutter, you know, you can really trim that down to sub -second, sometimes sub second reloads, which is like quite awesome, really. Uh, just the, the ease of positioning components on the screens. It's just, uh, it really is quite fun to work with, I would say. That's that's my main reason. I mean, like, for me, <clears throat> I have an Android, like, development background. So after a while, I started to see that I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. But with the Flutter's approach to the problems, I have started to feel like I'm actually being more productive. So this is, like, a really, really important to me because I want to enjoy what I'm doing. I want to know what I'm doing. And this really helps. Plus, like, obviously, there are, like, uh, cross-platform approaches. But 
being promised to be able to deploy it to desktop and web is also like really exciting. So mm. that's why I think well, for me, is. that's why I switched my career uh, towards being a Flutter developer. Yeah, I would say for me, it's definitely the productivity side that's really, really speeding things along. I mean, especially when you have to uh, put a proof of concept out to your, your boss or something like this, and you can actually build an application that's more or less complete. You know, it's, uh, it's really, really useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Sally, would you like to? Uh, yes. Exactly. So now we have Dominic. I mean, Dominic is like, actually, for me, Dominic is the desktop person because he talks about how you can actually uh, take advantage of Flutter by like using its desktop support and so on and so forth. He has really good talks. But like, what I know of him from is like I knew him from like Flutter Warsaw and Flutter Europe as well because he did the Flutter Europe app in Flutter, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's exactly. right. Exactly. And right now he's working as a freelance mobile developer focused on Flutter. And yeah, like he's a Flutter guru for me. So I'm really excited for your talk. And today he will Thanks talk about coming convenient internalization of Flutter apps. So we are done. OK, thanks. Th thank you very much, Sally. Thanks, George. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, and as Sally said, I'm going to talk about internationalization in Flutter apps. Uh, so maybe let's not uh, spend any more time on introductions and just go straight to the topic. Uh, so uh, as Sally said, uh, I'm a freelance Flutter developer. Uh, I've been working with Flutter since 2018. Before that, I was using Xamarin and .NET on the backend. Uh, I am uh, involved with Flutter Warsaw and Flutter Europe conference. Uh, you can find out more uh, on our Twitter and uh, websites. And you can also read some of my blog posts on my blog post, uh, on my blog, roszkowski.dev. Uh, recently, I've been posting some code pen challenges. So if you're into that, uh, I can kindly invite you to follow me. Uh, so uh, Sally said at the beginning that internationalization is kind of a problem for us uh, all the time. Like we have to do it, but we don't want to do it. Uh, sometimes we are struggling with that. There are many, many ways to do it. There is an official way uh, by a Flutter team uh, describing the guidelines. Uh, there is a way, uh, there are many ways uh, described on GitHub. Uh, repositories. Uh, there are many talks about it. And today we're going to go through some of them, uh, like the official one, the automated one, and the one that I found the most convenient for me. Like uh, I've been doing several apps already. And like the one that I'm going to show you tonight is going to be like, in my opinion, the most convenient. Uh, so maybe let's start and like maybe start from the basics. What actually is uh, internationalization? And maybe you've heard also a term called localization. So there's a slight difference, and like many developers discuss what's like the uh, like uh, encyclopedic difference between them. So usually internationalization is a uh, like just adding a like support for several languages in your app that uh, and the app works across different countries across different locales uh, the same way. Like there is no difference, like the app is internationalized and like can work anywhere in the world. Uh, localization on the other hand is more focused on adapting your app to a given market. Let's say like apps developed for an uh, Arabic market or uh, Japan market or uh, United States are com might be completely different in their layout, in the navigation. Uh, some terms are maybe considered in some countries as a rude, uh, but in other they can be just typical words. So localization is also taking into account some um, specifics of a given market, specifics of a given language. Uh, and today we're going to just talk about internationalization, how to make it uh, efficiently, how to make it conveniently, mm -hmm. and like uh, how to uh, not to spend too much time on that. So maybe let's start with 
what Flutter actually provides in terms of internationalization. So by default, uh, Flutter supports only English. Uh, so you will get only English translation uh, for some um, common buttons, some uh, tool tips and so on. So they are usually, if you want to like get deep dive into that, I recommend the official documentation, but uh, let's briefly talk about how Flutter actually achieves that. So by default, Flutter using, using, is using something called uh, default material localization in material library and accordingly uh, Cupertino localizations in the iOS library. And there's also another um, localization like for general purpose widgets. So Flutter provides some popular terms like back, next, OK, cancel, and so on uh, for many of the uh, material widgets, um, but only in English. If you want to have support for more languages like Polish, German, in, uh, French, you have to add a package from the Flutter SDK called Flutter localization. Uh, by adding it to your fab spec, you will get additional 77 languages support uh, for Flutter. So let's see how it is actually done. So in order to do that, you just have to add uh, localization delegates to your material app. It's fairly simple. Yeah, you just add global material localizations that delegate uh, to your uh, material app, widgets, and Capertino. This way, uh, no matter whether you're using a material or Capertino library, you will be able to have the translations in one of the supported languages. So below that, you can see that there is supported locales. And here I just uh, added manually three uh, languages, which are English, Polish, and Chinese. So there are many ways to provide these locales. This is one of the simplest one. I just uh, submit the country code. But you can provide many different locales, like simplified Chinese, uh, traditional, and so on. So uh, if you, you can check uh, on the documentation for the Flutter localizations, which languages are actually supported. If you add this uh, delegates, and if you add this uh, supported locales, you'll be able to, for instance, uh, see localized uh, labels or tooltips in your app. So for instance, if you hover on the, uh, over a back button, you will see according message in your language. In Polish, it would be uh, Tofni. So this is like a first thing that you will do if you want to uh, add languages support to your app. Yeah, add, just add these delegates and we'll see uh, in a moment, like in details, what are they actually doing. So this is a simple app that uh, has this basic support from the um, Flutter SDK. So this is nothing else than just adding this uh, delegates to this app. And uh, this is displayed inside a device preview uh, package. So this is a package by Alois Daniel. And you can, for instance, change the current locale of a device that it is running. So for instance, Right now we can see that the current locale is English, but actually it is not English, this is Afrikaans, but I will explain this in a minute why uh, this displayed uh, English for Afrikaans. Let's, let us find the English one. There are many English locales, as you can see. So now we have a English locale in this app and we can see several uh, interesting things here. So for instance, uh, the returned by the uh, Flutter uh, country code is EN. The first weekday is zero, which is Sunday. The label for back button is back and for close is close. Uh, and the text and all the widgets look fairly normal. Yeah, so we have just alignment top left, alignment top start, and the text looks okay, just uh, like that. This app supports Polish, German, Hindu, Arabic, and Chinese. So maybe let, let us switch to Polish. And as you can see, some things have changed. So for instance, the current locale has changed to Polish. The first weekday is uh, Monday. Uh, the back and close labels are different. Yeah, these are just labels that would, would appear, uh, for instance, as a tooltip or in your um, dialogue. 
nothing else actually changed. So maybe let us change to some more, uh, uh, like some, some different language. So maybe let us try the uh, Hindu. Uh, so here we can see some other changes. So for instance, maybe you saw that the text size changed. Uh, also the uh, names are in the, in the Hindi language and the locale also changed. But I think the largest difference is visible if we switch to the Arabic. So let's just use simple Arabic. So here we can see how Flutter handles, so for, in, for instance, different directionality of a language. So directionality of a language says us whether the language is from left to right or right to left. So Arabic is uh, right to left. So the uh, widget that we were using here that was using the alignment directional actually uh, is using this directionality of a given locale. So it switched to the right side of the screen. Uh, the widget that doesn't use it uh, stayed on the left side. Uh, so actually the difference is that we are using top start, not top left. So that's uh, how you can distinguish the widgets that comply to the, the directionality. Also the weekday is changed, but here we can see a very interesting thing. So the uh, directionality of a uh, text also affected all the sentences that we have here in the app. So for instance, now this paragraph is aligned to the right uh, and the, uh, let's say, order of words here is also like from right to left. Uh, and uh, if uh, your user has a uh, locale that is not supported by Grab, so let's say choose Azerbaijani. So Azerbaijani is not supported by this app. So uh, we fall back always to in English by default. So uh, this is like quick overview of uh, capabilities of uh, default Flutter localizations. But of course, uh, this is not everything. So for instance, sometimes you can overwrite locale for given uh, subtree of your widgets. So for instance, maybe you need to uh, show some part of your app only in English or only in Polish. So we can do it very easily. You just need to wrap everything with a widget called localiz localization override. And here you can just provide the uh, given locale. And this subtree will always be in Polish, no matter what is the uh, locale of the app. Yeah? So this, this is fairly uh, simple. So for instance, maybe you have your news reader app and you, for instance, need to show some text in Arabic. So maybe you will want to switch to Arabic locale for this on for this page of the app. OK, but this only provides us with some uh, built-in uh, translations and only built-in behavior for the app. But how can we add some custom translations to the app? Let's say we have some many, we have some navigation, and we want to add uh, some names in our language to this. So there are several ways to do it, but let's go through the official docs from flutter.dev. So uh, this is fairly simple. Uh, you need to write some boilerplate, boilerplate code in order to achieve that. But actually, if you do it like for the second or the third time, it's fairly straightforward. So everything is based around uh, localization delegates and widgets called uh, localization. So firstly, you need to create a class called, let's say in this case, demo localization. And we are not going to use any kind of files right now. Like we are not going to use JSON files. We are not going to use XML or ARB. We will just use this uh, single file to store our translation. So here you can see that I have this localized values uh, map. And the only thing that I do here is that I just type that for English locale, I have my title, which is hello world. And for Spanish, I have title, which is hola mundo. And that's all. Like if I want to add another term, I will just add this here and in all the languages that, that I want to support. But as you can see, there are many problems with that. We're going to solve them in a minute, but as you can see, this is going to be very problematic if you let, let's say have one, hundreds of terms in your app and let's say several languages. 
But assume for now that we are just using this very, very simple uh, class that stores its locale, uh, provides this uh, uh, helper method localizations of, and that's all. Okay, so the sec second uh, part is going is uh, to create a custom class that will extend the localization delegate. And here we will provide the uh, type of demo localizations. And, <clears throat> and this class will handle the updates if are necessary, or if we were to use some kind of um, uh, file that would have to be reloaded, let's say it's JSON file, or this is some kind of database that we have in the background. Uh, and this will handle um, the request for, let's say, reload. So for instance, we would be notified that the user locale has been changed, uh, then this class will handle uh, the reload of the uh, terms. And how to use it? It's also very simple. You just add your delegate that you created uh, as one of the localizations delegate to your material app. And you provide the supported locales. In our case, it was English and Spanish. Uh, and if you want to access anything from the locale, you just call the demo localizations of context.title. And if we go back to our uh, demo localizations, we'll see that here I have my getter uh, called title, and it just returns the value from this very map. This is like the very, very simple way to do it. Uh, and if you, let's say, have your very simple app, this might be enough. So for instance, I do it uh, for my presentations and that uh, I have in Polish and English that I just have some simple map of translations and I can switch between them even, even without um, like uh, reloading any file. But this is this doesn't scale well, yeah? Like this will have some issues. You have to maintain your uh, map in uh, the Dart file and so on. So let's get it to the uh, uh, like higher level and let us meet the INTL package. So INTL package, package is a official package that provides many, many fantastic things related to internationalization. So uh, it gives us ability to format numbers, format currencies, uh, time, and so on. But today, we're just going to focus on, on how to use INTL to translate our app. <clears throat> so INTL is based on, um, is using uh, command line tools, uh, uh, that are part of the INTL package. So in order to use INTL to translate your app, we are going to first create a Dart file that will be used to generate ARB files. And I'm gonna talk about ARB files in a second. Then if you will have your ARB files generated from your app, you can send them to your translator or translate on your own in some tool. Uh, and when you have your ARB files, you can just uh, import them to your uh, Flutter project and regenerate Dart code uh, with this uh, third co command generate from ARB. And this will generate all the necessary translation files. But I think that this slide is not uh, clear enough. So maybe let us move to the VS code and see for ourselves how it's actually done. So maybe at first, let's see my comments that I uh, executed before that. So before starting my presentation, I generated all the, all the necessary files. So I run this command. You can copy this from the documentation. It doesn't matter actually. The only important thing is that we are using the INTL translation tool uh, with the extract to ARB option and we're giving some outputs and inputs. So. At first, I had my uh, localization del delegate and local demo localization class. So uh, this is my demo localization class that I created. This is based on the uh, sample from the INTL package. So 
if you want to learn more, you can just go to the INTL documentation, but let us let us go through this. And I created my term. I also had to create it manually, you know, like uh, at this stage, we're doing this manually, but the fun thing is that I don't have to do it um, uh, mm, like in a map of strings and dynamics or, or strings or string of strings. So I have my title, which is hello world uh, of name title. And this is some description. Actually, it doesn't matter what is here. And locale name is just uh, from the provided from the current locale in the app. Then I had my demo localizations delegate, uh, which is very, very simple in this case. And the important part is that I'm using here the INTL message function. And this, uh, if you want, you can see the source code. But the important part is that this will get me proper translation term from the ARB file, but actually from the Dart file. Yeah. So uh, if I had this, I just uh, called the this first command. Then I send my translation ARB files to my translator. They return me a some English and Spanish translations. So let us see them. So the first one is English, yeah. So this is fairly simple. So my translator put here, hello world, and in Spanish, hola mundo. So I had this English and Spanish translation. And second part was here. I generated from ARB my Dart uh, localization files, messages N and messages Spanish, yeah. So that's uh, all I had um, to do. So uh, here you can see this is not too readable, but if you take a look here, you will see that I have my title key. And this is using this method simple message to look up for uh, the um, for the term. But as you, can, as you can see, this is not so simple to understand. Uh, so maybe there's some better way to do it. So is it really so convenient? And in my opinion, it's not. So you can base some of your custom solutions based uh, upon that. You can create some uh, other files, let's say JSON files that will be uh, used by INTL. You can use some database. You can use uh, CSV files or whatever uh, works for you. But um, at some point, you will reach this uh, point that you will not want to uh, update either the CSV file, either the JSON, or whatever. Like it will be just too time. It will be just too time consuming to uh, go back and forth between these files and remember to regenerate them and so on and so on. So there are some solutions uh, on the market that actually take all this uh, from you. Uh, and I know how it sounds, but actually, I really enjoy translations of my app right now. So meet the Flutter INTL extension. Uh, this works for VS Code and Android Studio. Here's the screenshot from the VS Code one. And this is a extension that streamlines your work with the internationalization and ARB files. Uh, this is created by the Localizely team. Uh, they have uh, their paid uh, translation platform. You don't have to use it to uh, use the Flutter INTL extension. You can use any other uh, translation platform, but it will be a bit more difficult. But in general, you can use uh, this without uh, any third party platform. So uh, let's us like uh, focus for a second on this translation platform. So at some point when you will have many members of your team and you will have, uh, let's say, product owner uh, and other people involved uh, in creation of your app, you will have to like divide your work. So I recommend uh, in such case to just use some translation tool to handle all of your translations. It can be localizedly, it can be Poe Editor, Crowd in Loco and Bubble Edit, which is a desktop editor. All of them in some way support Flutter, not perfectly, like the best one is Localizely, and then maybe Babel Edit, and these three are a bit worse. But 
if you don't want to use them and if you don't want to, let's say, pay for them, you can always use the Google spreadsheet. So there are many, there's many ways to use Google spreadsheet for translation. And if you have some supported uh, output format, let's say JSON, you can convert uh, this file to the ARB pretty easily with this tool from BMW Tech. It also doesn't work uh, perfectly for all the cases, but in general, it works just fine. So, uh, okay. So I was talking about this ARB files for, um, for some time. So maybe take a look at them. So uh, as you can see here, here is my um, basic ARB file. And this is actually JSON. I think it's not like proper JSON. Uh, it, it sometimes it may not be um, parsed correctly. So that's why this is using Android resource uh, bundle uh, extension. This was developed by Google. It was uh, used in Google Translation Toolkit. Right now, uh, it is not used any, like the translation toolkit is gone. So there are not no official tools that support ARB. Uh, uh, ARB files. But the fun part of ARB files is that it supports uh, plural forms and it supports genders. So for instance, let us see some basic uh, ARB file that I have prepared. Uh, so, and place, placeholders. So here you can see uh, some uh, ARB term, which is a current locale, and it has this curly braces, and this is a placeholder that can be uh, updated dynamically by developer. So you don't have to store, let's say, uh, currency, you don't have to store age or whatever uh, inside your uh, translation. It will be interpolated by uh, INTL uh, in the runtime. So this is very fun part. Also, uh, I'm not sure if I can show you here, but I will try to do it in a second. Uh, ARB files support plural forms and support genders. Uh, so maybe let's start with some uh, demo. So here is an app that uses the uh, Flutter, I, like the INTL translation and is using the uh, ARB files. So I can, the only thing that I can do here is just to switch my locale from English to German. Yeah, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, so, let me show you how you can actually work with translations and not spend too much time with that. So here uh, is my project on Localizely. Uh, small disclaimer, this is a paid platform, so not everybody can like, afford this, but they have some free plans for open source and so on. And I really enjoy it. Like, uh, I think this is one of the best, like next to the Po Editor, this is one of the best platforms to translate. So uh, maybe let me increase the uh, font size here. Okay, so here, I don't know if you can see everything, but uh, here I have some uh, translation terms. So here's my current locale, uh, some title, a nice thing is that I can provide some screenshots for my translators, but uh, here is uh, this term that we can see in my app. Willkommen on here. If I switch to German, willkommen. And the great part with the uh, uh, with this setup is that I can just update this here. This is already saved. Then I go to my VS Code. I run INTL download. It is downloading my translations from the uh, from the localizedly. If I go to my German translation, we can see that this changed. Actually, we can see the difference. This changed to from willkommen to hello. Uh, like it's it took five seconds maybe. It doesn't always work with uh, hot reloads, so I need to restart my app. But I can quickly go to this page that I wanted to show you. And here you can see it's already changed to hello. And of course I showed it in slow-mo, but actually you can do it like 
if you add some new text to your app or you just copy this from the design, you can do it uh, like an, with the same pace, like for instance, you run your tests or you uh, look up the design uh, specification. Yeah, This is starting to be one of your like common steps when you develop. You just switch to another window, add new term. So maybe let us add new term. And let's enable the plural support. And German and English have very similar ways of uh, plural forms. So maybe, uh, maybe not to good example, but for instance, in Polish, we have multiple forms of plurals. Oh, actually it should be in German, yeah. But actually it doesn't matter right now. Yeah, so uh, I added some dummy um, terms. And if I go to my VS Code and down, download my ARP files, they will be immediately visible here. And as you can see, this term is uh, right now supporting the plural forms. If uh, the... Elton and file was regenerated automatically for me, and if I go to, let's say, some test widget that I have here, I can easily use this in my app. Uh, it was test. And I can just provide, let's say, a uh, number. And depending on the number, the proper form will be used. So if it would be one, it would be one. If it would be, uh, maybe let's go to this demo. Which was here and let us add here not return one if i use two it will be more yeah so as you can see it works pretty nice uh you can also add support for genders and so on so it's like game changer if you're using some basic translation tool like just JSONs or uh, mm, your own custom solution. I think that if you will try this, you will just want, don't want to come back to previous solution. OK. So uh, just to like wrap up uh, uh, before we finish. So uh, you can find the, like the manual that's to to go through this on my website, but you can also go through the documentation of the uh, Flutter INTL. Uh, just to uh, like sum up all the uh, points that I wanted to mention today. So use some translation tool. Don't edit your localization files manually in VS Code or Android Studio. Uh, Use a tool that is uh, designed for that. It could be desktop application, it could be web application, it could be free one or paid one. There are many ways to choose from. Um, if you don't want to use the uh, localized read platform, which is paid, you can create your own custom bash script that will uh, fetch this from the uh, API. Most of the translation tools like Poe Editor or Localizely or whatever, they provide some API to fetch the translation tool. You can also fetch the translation tool, uh, translation files from uh, Google Spreadsheet. Mm. And I think the most important uh, remark is that you have to uh, add this like step of adding translation to your common process of developing your app. Like, if you will wait with adding translations till the end of your mm, development cycle, you won't do it. Like, I can promise you, if you haven't added translations for three months, then at some point you will just can't, uh, you won't be able to go through all of them, even with some regex or uh, some scripts, it will be almost impossible to add all of them at once. So my recommendation is if you haven't started it yet, start it now. If you start a new project, add your translations uh, in your design process uh, and if you can outsource the translations to the customer, outsource it to some translator. But 
the most important thing is that you have to uh, make keep in mind that you have to keep this translation and your app in sync. Otherwise, it will just be very problematic to add this later. Yeah, and as I said, you can just skip this third par party tools like localizely or Poeditor or Crowdin uh, if you can afford them. But uh, even though you, you, you should use some um, translation solution. So uh, one important remark is that if you are developing for iOS, you have to also add this uh, translations here in the Xcode. Yeah, so we just add plus and the translation and the language that your app should be translated to. This way you can also, for instance, translate your uh, permission strings. And this is like full text, uh, full, slide full of text just to uh, sum up all the, all the presentation. So uh, as you saw from the beginning till the end, like this very uh, last way of uh, translating your app, everything is based on the localization delegate. Yeah. So uh, like, even if even this extension is using the localization delegates um, under the hood, so you can uh, fairly easily understand this on your own. As you saw, there is there are many ways to add translations, internationalization to your app. You can use some custom localization delegate that will read the translation terms from JSON or XML. You can use your uh, localization delegate from the INTL package. Uh, it was the second way. You can use some automated code generation uh, with this INTL, Flutter INTL extension. You can use other tools, like there is a very popular extension called VS Code Flutter IN18N JSON. Uh, I think it has 20 something thousand downloads. You can use Google Spreadsheet, and I think that many people actually do it. Uh, you can use uh, any other form of uh, handling your translation outside of your app. Uh, important remark, uh, I showed you uh, like slight uh, glimpse of uh, how it works, but beware of uh, directionality. So test your app in different locales and the device preview package is very useful for that. So you don't have to switch your device locale just to test your app in different language. And add the internationalization support as soon as possible. If you haven't done it yet, do it tomorrow. Uh, and I think I uh, I will tell you, you will be grateful that you started to do it early. Okay, I finished before my uh, deadline, so because I uh, thought that uh, it will take me much more time. But uh, this is all. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just go now through the maybe. I'm not sure if you have questions right now. Uh, Okay. Hello, Dominic. We're going to be proceeding with questions after Remy's. So everybody, yes. if you okay. want to queue up your questions inside the uh, the YouTube chat, then we'll be sure to try and answer as many as we can. Dominic, that was a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So I would also thank you very much for handling this event. Like this is a very great opportunity for the Flutter community uh, combined meetup. Uh, I'm really really excited to see next presentations. I hope that you will have fun. Uh, with uh, Remy, with Katerina, with uh, Rodi. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, well, you'll be back now, for answering questions at the end. So don't yeah, forget. of course, uh, in an hour. Yeah, like I will stay. Yeah, you here, are not going uh, away. So. <laughs> yeah, thank but you. This is the first time. of many of these uh, joint meetups. It's really, really good. All right, Remy. Well, I'd like to introduce Remy, yeah. the, uh, the the developer of Provider, Flutter Hooks, Functional Hello. Widget. The list goes on. So, like, really, you know, we have a superstar amongst us. Um, so, Remy, I'll let you uh, take over. Uh, I understand your talk is roughly about 40 minutes. So, yep, thank you very much, yep. Remy. Yeah. Let me share my slides. Oh. Oh, so it's not the right screen. Wait a second. This one. Oh, that's still that's still not the right one. Why? I don't understand. Yeah. All right. T 
to you. All right. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so today um, I want to talk about something slightly different uh, than what I usually do. Uh, I will talk about uh, me um, reinventing provider recently. Uh, so before you start panicking and trying to uh, wonder if you have to uh, migrate everything, you, you don't. Uh, it's mostly at a, the experimental stage. Uh, and I just want to share it with you um, to get some feedback with the community and see if it's something uh, that, that is actually uh, interested, uh, that you are actually interested in. So uh, the code name of this project is uh, Riverpod. If you're wondering why Riverpod, it's basically just because it's an anagram of provider. So I find it funny. <laughs> Uh, it's not very funny, but whatever. Um, so, uh, the way it will go is uh, the first step of this talk will be to uh, go through the history of uh, state management in a way to see the different problems that provider tries to solve. And then we'll go through um, what that experimental project does. Uh, so the very first problem uh, a provider tries to solve is um, usually uh, it's, com it's commonly known that uh, globals and uh, singletons uh, are not necessarily a good thing for uh, large data applications. Um, there are multiple reasons that you can find on uh, different articles online. But the short story is um, the one of the reasons is uh, globals and singletons can be accessed everywhere uh, and modified everywhere too. Um, so what that means is as the application grows, um, you have more and more of these global variables and you have more uh, things that modify these variables. But since it's done uh, without any restriction, um, it's very difficult to keep track of the flow of the, of the application. So as the is learning how to, uh, learning the code base as the application grows becomes incredibly, incredibly difficult. And the second point is uh, they make testing more difficult. By that, by that I mean, uh, for example, if you have multiple tests, um, you may find yourself in a situation where, for example, in this snippet, if you run the second test first and then the first test, both will pass. But if you run the first test first and then the second test, the second test will fail because they depend on some common variables, but these variables are not reset um, when, the when a test is finished. So one way to fix this kind of problem would be to use uh, setup and teardowns uh, inside your tests. But even then, um, it's still not ideal uh, as, again, as the application grows, you will have more and more of these variables. And so you will need to add more and more stuff to the setup and teardowns. And it's also something that you have to think about. It's not done naturally. So you could find yourself with silent errors and have bugs in your uh, in your code without noticing it. So you may you may have bugs uh, and your test not detecting them early enough. So a solution for this uh, that the community found is to use United widgets for this kind of thing. Uh, there are two main reasons for it. Uh, one of them is um, United widgets. Uh, as there are widgets uh, benefits from the something called unidirectional data flow, which is a way of restricting the flow of the application uh, voluntarily to make things more scalable. And, and secondly, um, the widget uh, it makes that the widget tree uh, two, two different tests don't share state. Um, and the way it's typically used is that instead of declaring a global variable, we uh, add 
a new widget inside our widget tree that contains this variable and expose it to the widget tree. Uh, so the consequence is on our tests, um, instead of having a global variable, then uh, both of our tests uh, will use that provider widget. But the thing is, uh, both tests will uh, use a unique instance of the objects that you want to expose. So both tests don't share state, and therefore you don't need to do these setup and teardowns. So you remove the complexity here. And there are also side benefits to using uh, inherited widgets. For example, it allows listening to objects in a one-liner. So you don't need these builders um, to do the, the listening. So you get some increased readability here because you get more focus on what matters instead of having this huge boilerplate. Then, um, Sorry. They are DevTool compatibles. Um, since they are widgets, they are in the widget tree. And therefore, when you ins inspect the widget tree, you are able to uh, inspect the state of your in inherited widgets. So here we see a screenshot of what happens when you use provider. And you can see the state of your change on your provider. Uh, you also get increased reusability uh, of your widgets because uh, the widgets that are using these global states uh, are decoupled from uh, the variable itself, which means you can potentially override um, these global variables for a specific part of the application. Uh, one use case would be, for example, uh, to have a tutorial screen uh, kind of like this, where uh, typically uh, in a normal application, you would do the tutorial screen with a screenshot. But another way of doing it would be to reuse the MyApp widget, but with different providers uh, mocked uh, such that there is no HTTP request involved. This way you get this same behavior as a screenshot, but dynamic, so you could um, you could make it uh, internationali internationalized or animated, for example, which may be very powerful. So that's very cool. But inherited widgets are not without issues. For example, they introduce um, runtime exceptions. By that, uh, I mean that when you call the meta to obtain the, the inherited widget, be it scopemodel.off or provider.off, there is the possibility that the object you're trying to, to access is not located, uh, is not inside the widget tree, so you cannot access it. Or the uh, build context that you are using is not able to read the, um, the provider, uh, such as, for example, if it was in a different, widget, in, in a different branch of the widget tree. Uh, so uh, one of the issues with this is um, it's, it's pretty confusing uh, for a big part of the Flutter community as uh, the build context object is not necessarily natural and therefore many people uh, are getting uh, these runtime exceptions and don't understand why. Uh, and Scott Mullen tried to solve this uh, with a widget called uh, Scott Model Descendant or if you're using provider, it's called consumer. Uh, but even then, it still doesn't really fix the problem. And we get the, uh, we don't have the one-liner anymore. Um, yeah. Another problem that I like, uh, I like to name it uh, the nesting L, where um, as the application grows, uh, you, are, you have more and more of these providers. So what looks readable in the beginning starts to become more like this, where you have tons of uh, nested uh, inherited widgets, which is not very readable. Uh, and a third problem is um, the build method of a widget has to be what we call pure. Uh, by that, I mean um, the build method or the, or the builder parameter of a widget can be called many times. 
and it can be called at any time. You don't have, you should not uh, prevent the build method from being called. But that's not that's something that uh, people don't necessarily realize. And what it implies is that uh, you should not perform HTTP requests or uh, create state inside the build method and builder. Uh, otherwise, uh, you could uh, potentially lose the state of your application when you uh, like go to a new screen or open the keyboard. And many people got uh, got stuck on this problem. Uh, finally, um, there is too much disparity between packages because, at least at the time, because um, say if you're using block provider from uh, two years ago, it was uh, there was a library uh, called block provider from DJ Bullens. Uh, if you're using the inherited widget uh, from block provider, or and you cannot use that block provider with um, this scope model descendant widget from scope model, you cannot combine them because both of them use different inherited widgets internally and they are not compatible with each other. So we kind of end up in a situation where we have to reinvent uh, these utilities for all the different libraries using inherited widgets. So this causes uh, some confusion in the community where uh, something that is inside a library, but not inside another one. And everybody tries to solve the same problems, but differently. And it's not very, very good. Um, yeah. And so that's why provider was introduced. Uh, the main reason why uh, it was introduced was to first try and fix this um, disparity issue by introducing a new st standard that everybody use. So we want, uh, I wanted to make a linear inherited widget that works for pretty much all use case, such that uh, the utilities can be reused for everyone. Uh, then we want to solve the nesting problem by introducing a multi-provider widget, which makes the widget really linear and therefore more readable. Uh, similarly, it solves the uh, build method is pure problem by changing slightly the way uh, inherited widgets are used. So we are going from creating the object directly uh, as inside the parameter to passing a function that creates the parameter. Uh, this way, the function is executed only once, even if the, re the widget rebuilds. So therefore, we are guaranteed to not lose the state. And it's more natural in this way. So um, Provider did a pretty good job at uh, solving this problem, at least in my opinion. It's widely accepted by the community now. Uh, so that's great. But uh, it's still not perfect. Um, the runtime exceptions that I mentioned previously is still an issue. Uh, and um, it's not as flexible as it should be. Like for example, uh, many people have requested stream proxy provider, but it's not necessarily possible to do. Uh, or uh, there are limitations like you can't have two providers using the same type, or uh, people also want to uh, dispose the state of a provider when the provider is not used anymore, but still in the widget tree. Um, and finally, another problem is uh, people um, don't necessarily like that it depends on Flutter, and they think uh, they, they want to extract this logic of exposing widgets, uh, exposing state, sorry, uh, outside of Flutter to kind of separate the logic between UI and business logic. Yeah, so. These problems can't be fixed as part of provider, at least not uh, in a way that wouldn't break everyone's code. So that's not very reasonable. Uh, and the main reason for this is because um, these problems are deeply rooted in how provider or inherited widgets in original works. This will require a very low level change to be fixed. Um, so, 
that's why uh, the product River Pod that I mentioned previously is all about. Like I mentioned, it's very experimental. It's absolutely not made to replace provider, at least not in the short term. It's more testing the possibilities and uh, seeing if it's truly a solution. And then if it is, maybe it may replace provider, but at least not in the short term. So to explain more about the project and how it works, um, I think uh, a good way to do so would be to uh, start with a simple hello world. So what we want, we want, what we will do is create uh, a state that contains a simple hello world string, and then we will try to read it. So first, to create this uh, this state, uh, what we would do is uh, create a provider. So creating a provider uh, using Riverpod is um, by creating a global constant. So it's, it's this line here. Uh, you use the provider class, and then it, you specify a callback that returns this state you want to create. So here, a simple hello world string. And then you give it whatever name you want. So here, uh, greeting provider. And then um, the other step is um, inside your main, you need to wrap uh, your uh, application in a new widget called provider scope. It's kind of similar to multi-provider, but it doesn't take the providers as parameter. You don't need to pass anything to it. Um, then finally, to consume the value, you have multiple solutions. Uh, the first one is to use um, the Flutter hooks library that I made too. Uh, so using Flutter hooks, we could uh, use a hook widget and not a stateless widget, a hook widget, and then use the use provider function. So uh, using that use provider function, what we will do is we would pass to the use provider the provider that we want to consume. So here, greeting provider. And then that function will return the uh, current value exposed by the provider. And then we can uh, use that value to do our, uh, to build our widget tree. Another solution would be to use a stateless widget, um, like we would do uh, in typical Flutter. And um, instead use a consumer widget. So it's slightly more verbose, but it doesn't depend on further hooks. And the principle is slightly similar in that um, that consumer widget uh, takes the provider that you want to consume as a parameter. And then uh, it takes a secondary parameter that is a builder callback, which receives the value consumed as, uh, as parameter and then builds a widget out of, out of it. So, one thing you may have noticed is that providers are no longer obtained by uh, type. As, um, instead, they are obtained by reference on the provider, which has an interesting consequence, uh, which is that it's compile safe uh, in the sense that you don't, uh, if you are able to write the line use provider my provider, then you are uh, guaranteed to be able to obtain the state of the provider. Because uh, when doing so, uh, this will automatically create the uh, this will automatically insert the state higher in the hierarchy, um, like you would typically do in in provider. So you don't get this runtime exception anymore by doing so, which is great. Uh, a second point would be since we don't we are not using types anymore. Uh, that means we can have as many providers of the same type as we want. So for example, we could split it into two different providers, uh, such that, uh, for example, we could split the L award into an interjection and, in, and a noun. So, and then we could consume them independently similarly. So reuse provider, interjection provider, use, noun, uh, use provider, my noun. And finally, um, since uh, we are reading them by variables once again, 
then we could technically make the variable private or limit it to a specific file. So it allows more freedom on who can access the provider. Um, but then you may be wondering uh, that at the beginning of the talk, I, I mentioned that uh, global variables are not necessarily scalable. So why am I making global variables once again? But the thing is, um, this is not exactly global variables. Uh, because uh, while our provider is declared globally, uh, the state of the provider is not stored inside the provider. In fact, the state of the provider is, is stored inside that provide scope widget, uh, which means that uh, first, it's dev tool friendly uh, because it's, in, it's stored inside a widget. So you will be uh, able to inspect the state inside your dev tool. But more importantly, uh, when you're writing tests, we get the same benefits once again of uh, if you have two tests, both of them will point to a different instance of the widget tree. So there still won't be shared state between the tests. So you won't have the issues mentioned previously. Similarly, um, it, re it re implements the same logics as with uh, inherited widgets. So you could still re implement the mechanism of overriding the state for a specific widget tree by um, adding the provider scope widget as at a specific location where we want to override the provider and then add extra arguments to the provider. Uh, to the provider uh, to the widget so here uh, the parameter would be override uh, which takes a list of uh, override and an override would be created by uh, taking the part the provider that we want to override and then we call a function on that provider that is override for subtree the name may change but that's the basic id and to that function we pass the new behavior of the provider so here it says bonjour Paris, which is hello Paris in French, which means that now our tutorial screen will uh, receive bonjour Paris, but the rest of the application will receive hello world. So we get the same behavior as we mentioned previously. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, this project actually doesn't depend on Flutter to work. Uh, it's split into three different packages. Uh, the first of them is Riverpod, which contains the different providers, so provider, feature provider, whatever. Then there is uh, Flutter Riverpod, which exposes um, the provider scope, uh, consumer, and hooks Riverpod, which, 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 which expo exposes the use provider function. Um, so onto a slightly more complex example uh, to showcase um, combining providers. Uh, one example would be to, one use case would be to have a configuration file that is loaded from, uh, that is a, a JSON file. And then we want to instantiate a configuration object from that JSON file. Then we want to have a repository that is uh, depending on the configurations to obtain maybe an API key or the host or whatever. And then we want to create uh, a model to that will interact with this repository object and expose maybe stuff that the UI can use. And that model would depend on the repository. So to do this, um, here's uh, the entire code. Uh, the first step would be to create the configuration provider. So here, what we will use is we will use future provider because we want to we want to load our configurations asynchronously. So we want we would want to use the async await keywords, uh, which uh, future, pro future provider allows you to do. And then inside the callback of the future provider, we will uh, read the file 
decode it, and then create an instance of the object from the decoded JSON. Um, so that's it for the configuration. So the next step would be to create the repository. So for here, uh, for the repository, we will simply ex uh, create, we will simply use a simple provider. But, but the twist is we want to consume the configurations. So for this, we will need the, the parameter passed to the callback of provider. And that parameter is called uh, provider reference. Uh, this is kind of similar to the build context in Flutter, but is not related to Flutter. And it allows you to read uh, providers. So in that case, uh, here, what we will do is we will pass this provider reference object to the repository. And it's safe to do so once again, because this object doesn't depend on Flutter at all. It's not UI re related, so it's safe. Uh, and then uh, what we could do to obtain the configurations uh, is um, use that reference object and then call the method depend on. And so what we would do is call depend on and then pass the parameters that we want to consume. And here, um, since configuration providers is a future provider, uh, then it's loaded asynchronously. So uh, depend on will uh, return the future that you need to await to obtain the configurations. So uh, the repository here will await uh, the future to obtain the configurations and do something with it. Uh, so once again, we have this type safety of the thing. We are guaranteeing that uh, there is no situation in which we are trying to read the provider, but the provider is not actually ready yet. And then the final part would be to create the model. Uh, so to create the model, uh, we can use a change notifier provider. Uh, you don't have to use change notifier, it's just for the sake of the example. Uh, it's the most popular uh, alternative, I think. So here, uh, we could do things slightly differently than before. And instead of passing the provider reference to the model instance, we could read the provider directly inside the callback uh, using the same pattern as before, uh, using ref dot depend on my provider. And here it's worth noting that since it's not a future provider, but just a simple provider, uh, then it, uh, depend on doesn't return a future anymore. Instead, it returns the value directly. So you can just do depend on and access the value without having to await anything in particular. And then we pass that repository to our model object. And the model object itself is just a simple state notifier, a simple, a simple change notifier without anything in particular. So we can just skip it. Yeah. So um, there are some extra uh, extra features that I won't necessarily cover here as uh, we don't necessarily have the time, but it's worth noting that um, Riverpod also includes features such as um, automatically disposing the provider uh, when it's no longer used, uh, but still in the widget tree, uh, like we mentioned previously that was requested. Uh, it's also more flexible on, uh, on Combining providers, it exposes many different providers like state notifier provider, stream provider, uh, and it also exposes it as this uh, feature similar to you, what you would find in the provider package for filtering rebuilds such as selector. Uh, yeah. So, as a rapid conclusion. Um, Riverpod is uh, an experimental re rewrite of provider. It's not prediction related. It's it's merely an attempt to solve some problems, but uh, I don't want to push it for now uh, as a replacement for a provider. Uh, it may come in the future, but it's not necessarily sure. And uh, what it tries to solve is basically doing exactly the same thing as provider, but in a slightly different syntax such that it doesn't have, it doesn't have dependency on Flutter, 
and it's compile safe and more flexible for the commonly requested features. So that's the basic idea of the project. And I think that's about it. So yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Great talk. Sure, there are a lot of questions. Let's take a look at what there are more questions we've got. So, all right, so let's start with, uh, let's just pick a random one. So let's go from a, a, a Dominic one first. Somebody's asking, on our meta, I think you pronounced your name correctly, uh, is there any impact on API generated files that you're creating? So I didn't hear it uh, quite clearly. Can you like pause the question on yeah. the screen? Yes, we will do. Hold on. Hold cool. On. Okay, I can go and repeat the question. Maybe can you hear me better, Dominic? Uh, so, is there any impact on the APK size on uh, with these generated files? Of course, there is some impact. This is like very minuscule. Like they are all like several kilobytes at most. Like it depends, of course, on the number of terms that you have in your app, but you shouldn't be worried about it. And it works like for iOS and Android, so. Right, okay. Another, right, so another uh, flash, I mean, <laughs> flash, flutter person would be Christoph. How <laughs> oh, handle inline metadata in the localized strings like emphasis or links? Okay. So I was wondering about this also, uh, and I haven't come up with any uh, like good solution for that. So the only thing that I uh, can recommend is just to split the translation into several terms. I know it's not the best one uh, because you have to use the uh, text span widget, uh, which accepts like separate separated text spans. Uh, I've heard about like using some custom solutions. So you just take the uh, term, split it by some special character, and then use it. But like, there is no support for that. Uh, so the only way you could, you could, for instance, show HTML, but I don't think this is something that you'd like to do. Okay. Uh... Shall we proceed? Yeah. Cool. And like, there is another question about like another package. Do you know the package Easy Localization? Uh, so I checked it. And like, no. uh, there are many ways to do it. Uh, easy Localization is pretty popular, I think. Uh, so it simplifies some things. Uh, uh, it is uh, statically safe. It also supports plural and gender and so on. It has some support for JSON, CSV, uh, but like uh, I was missing some tooling support for that. Uh, so that's why I don't use it. But if somebody is comfortable with using easy localization, uh, mm -hmm. then go for it. Like uh, any uh, automatic solution is good uh, if it's used actually. Cool. I mean, like it's the same for everything, right? Once if it's some if something is working for you, there's no need to overcomplicate. Yeah. But if it doesn't work, then it's not yeah. the best tool for you. <laughs> That's right. I'm just the most performant with my approach, and mm -hmm. like uh, it works if you're a single developer, if you're in a team, because there is like common uh, guideline. Yeah, like there's an extension that you don't have to worry about. You don't have to onboard your new team member and like let them go through pages of documentation and so on. It's just like plug and play. And that's what I really value in this approach. Okay, cool. I mean, like there's one question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> no, I was just going to go and read some of the the, uh, the more questions that we've got, and got coming up. Sorry, guys, I'm actually reading through which ones we should put up for you. So there's quite a few, you can imagine. So somebody's uh, asking, various people actually have asked as well, uh, would you recommend writing tests for your for your translations? I'm not sure if like uh, for the translations itself, yeah, like uh, I don't think that you have to test the content of translation, but one important thing is to test your app in different locales and in different accessibility features. 
Yeah. So uh, if you're using, for instance, Flutter driver tests or any other UI tests, it's very uh, like useful to test it in different environments. So for instance, uh, iterate through all the supported locales of your application, change the text uh, scaling um, across the tests, yeah, just to see if everything is displayed correctly. Um, so I, I found that also many developers forget just to test the app uh, with the text scaling set to 2x or 3x. And I saw in my statistics in some of my apps that it, like the percentage of people that actually use the uh, bigger text scale on their phones is pretty high. It's like uh, usually 10, 20, even 30% depending on the on the app uh, you're developing. Yeah. So uh, maybe not the translations, but test the behavior of the app with different languages and accessibility settings. Okay, and one more question on, on, uh, on localization. This is, what are some free ARB editors? That's some game from so, various. Mm -hmm. The one that I like tested and recommend is the Babel editor. Uh, so this is a desktop application. Uh, uh, just like Babel. This is for many uh, formats of text. Um, there is a great editor called uh, um, Poeditor. Yeah, this is like also desktop application, but this doesn't support ARB directly. You have to convert from JSON to ARB. So this is not like straight uh, translation. There is localizely. There is an online ARB uh, uh, tool that was developed a few years ago, but it's missing some features like plural support. Like, I hope that maybe someone from Flutter community or uh, from the audience would like to take this challenge and create open source alternative. But right now, only like the paid ones, like Localizely, Poetit, or Crowdin have uh, quality ones. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, like, for, um, for me, I, I also want to say, like, one, two words to Remy. Like, seeing you here also a big chance for all the flutter community to ask you questions about like not just what you have done also what you're working on get a feedback and so on so like i want to continue with some questions to uh remy so if we can have the next question for him so remy if you use provider references do you need also provider singletons Mm, to be honest, I don't really understand the question. Uh, I mean, uh, if you mean, uh, do you need to create a class and the, the typical boilerplate involved to do a singleton? Uh, no, you don't necessarily need that in the sense that uh, the, single, the simple one-liner that we showed previously is, is enough and you don't need anything else. Uh, if you're thinking of something else that I don't understand what it is. I mean, maybe uh, Chris can a bit elaborate it. Let's continue with the next question until then. Why would you override the original provider instead of just creating a local provider with custom functionality? Like, what was the uh, idea actually? Um, mm, you mean in the, uh, in, if, if it's about the example with, um, uh, with the tutorial screen, it's um, because um, we may want to reuse existing widgets. And if we are reusing widgets, uh, then uh, we are at the same time reusing the fact that they are consuming a specific provider. So um, like for example, when you're using a raise button, uh, that, the raise button is using the same data. So uh, when you want to customize the raise button, you want to override the same not create a new a new time instance so that's the same principle with uh, providers you, you may want to override the provider because you're reusing the equivalent of uh, of the team okay, okay cool Next question so the new river pod is like provider but no linger longer i presume needs a context reference uh yeah uh like I mentioned previously, um, it adds um, an equivalent to uh, the build context that is 
um, the uh, provider reference object. But most of the most of the time, like for example, if you are using hooks, uh, this is it and for this is, this is done implicitly for you, and uh, it doesn't depend on Flutter. So yeah, you don't actually need to use the beyond context if uh, specifically. Okay. Next question, please. Yeah. Um, so basically, you have all. Also, another library called State Notifier. Okay, yeah. Did we jump to jump to another I question? I think the banner <laughs> changed first. Uh, there was a yeah. different banner. Okay, so the question is: Riverport looks promising, but what about the other relatively new library, State Notifier? It's also from you, right? Yeah, Remy. Um, I mean, they are uh, not competing with each other. They are actually uh, compatible. Uh, similarly to how um, this river pod thing is combined with Flutter hooks. So uh, state native here and uh, river pod, for example, and, and hooks all combines together instead of competing. So in this case, what you would do is instead of using change native here provider, you would use a state native here provider, and then it would work with state native here. Cool. Okay, the next question. This question would be. Um, do you want to say I mean, like this the... question? Was, yeah, do, this question was about some like code samples that you have used. Like it was why the that feature after the depend on. I don't know if you remember the exact point of this. Uh, yeah, but uh, I can I can share my screen if it's needed. Um. It's um, basically the function uh, depend on doesn't directly return the future to obtain the provider because it exposes other methods at the same time, uh, such as um, a way to listen to the value uh, directly, like for example, as stream or uh, on change and other things. So, so that's why we have to do that dot future. Okay, cool. Right, we're still looking for questions still. Feel free to post them into the chat. We're trying to monitor those as much as we can as well. There is one. How would you handle persistency of localization? Where is introduced as if we need to have a writing? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the question is, I suppose, about uh, changing the locale and then restoring the current locale. So. Uh, by default, the app will be running in the locale that is uh, set in the device. Yeah, so if you support English, it will be in English and so on. So we have to uh, override this on startup. So uh, for instance, you can store the current locale in shared preferences in Hive, uh, in uh, your SQLite database, wherever you store your settings. So you have to use some kind of uh, persistence storage. Like uh, I recommend Hive. Uh, this is very simple to use, but you can also use shared preferences, and this also works well. Dominic, okay, okay Dominic. so another question mm -hmm. uh, about the calendar and data in picker. If it supports the, uh, if it supports the uh, different starting day of the week. That's right. That's right. Uh, so uh, by default, if you don't provide the, because there is a method show date time picker in uh, material that opens the calendar uh, date time picker so uh, by default it is using english locale so if you don't provide the parameter locale it will ignore the current locale i think that uh, flutter team is working on that and actually i am checking this right now uh, if uh, if it works because it doesn't work uh, like uh, if you don't provide the locale, but if you do, then the calendar uh, is using the localizations and so on. So because of the fact that by default, by default, Flutter doesn't provide the different um, locales like Arabic, Chinese, Polish, and so on, the data in picker by default doesn't have it, but it doesn't know that you are using the uh, uh, delegates for the 
um, for the languages. So we have to explicitly provide this uh, locale to the uh, show data in Picker. Also, you can provide your custom words. Uh, like for instance, if you have this cancel select uh, month, week or so. So you can, uh, the show data in Picker has also some parameters. So we can just override them with your desired uh, terms. Okay, I, right, we're going to go, oh, one more, one more last question. So any plans to release the packages anytime soon so we can give them a try and give feedback? Uh, yeah, um, actually it's going to be released um, relatively soon, maybe in a week or two. I'm still working on the documentation uh which is on riverpod.dev which you can access right now and uh there is the, the, the yeah in a few weeks okay Riverpod.dev. all right then everybody so we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with katrina on her for her talk on block um so five minutes is that okay with everybody sally yeah uh, all you know, good for everybody. so We'll cue the slide and we will be back shortly. Thank you.
All right, we're back. So hopefully everybody's managed to refresh themselves a little bit. So we've got uh, Kate next to talk to us about um, uh, uh, Flutter Block. Hi, Kate. Well, let's Hi, Sally. Hi, everyone. Hello. You are working with um, um, Berlin on this one. Yeah, I mean, like we booked her earlier than you people. <laughs> so welcome back, everyone. We have Katarina with us right now. I'm really happy to have her in this talk because, like, he she is like really, really uh, an amazing mobile developer. She is also a Google developer expert for Dart and Flutter as well. She is a woman tech maker's lead for Switzerland, so you can see that she's doing a lot of community work. And today she will talk about the sharp corners of blog. She will share her ideas and um, observations about implementing blog with us. So, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. A little bit about me. I'm Katarina, and I'm Flutter developer at Fastic, and I'm also Google developer expert uh, for Flutter and Dart. And um, so in my free uh, time, I also organize events uh, because I am co-organizer of uh, Flutter Zurich and uh, Women Tech Makers Switzerland uh, Meetup. And uh, so let's go to the presentation. Um, today I'll talk about block site management. I was using, I've used block when I was uh, working on my private project. It's called the Learn Flashcards. Uh, this is an app that helps to learn anything. And um, I had this idea uh, like code sharing where I use uh, block site management and um, like for backend and for the front end. I'll use uh, Flutter, and it was before um, Flutter for Web was announced, and uh, I'd like to use also um, Flutter Web uh, using Angular Dart and to share uh, backend. And I went with uh, block state management, and I'd like to share my uh, observations and edge cases of implementing it. And uh, this is an agenda of today's talk. We'll have a look what block is and discuss rules of block. Then we'll see um, block in Flutter Hello World app. And uh, after that, uh, we have a look on some edge cases of implementation block in non-trivial app with complex architecture. And um, complex architecture in this context doesn't necessarily mean an enterprise app. It's going to be at least one step further from Hello World app and um, may include persistence, error handling, validations, and a large amount, amount of data. Let's start with the history of BLOCK. BLOCK stands for Business Logic Component and was presented by Google as a Dart Con 2018. And it was designed to allow the reuse of the same code, code base independently of the platform, like web application, mobile, or backend. And to implement block, we need to know such terms as stream controller, stream sync, and uh, stream builder. Stream is a continuous flow of data, and uh, stream has a single direction. You can only read from stream, and you cannot write to it. And sync takes an input, and you can only write to sync. You cannot read from it. And Streams and syncs come in pair. When we write to sync, it creates, it creates an event in stream. And to create a sync stream pair, we can use stream controller class. To create a sync, we can call a property sync in stream controller. And to get a stream, we can call a property stream. And uh, stream and syncs are also typed. Here's a diagram how a pair looks like. When we create a pair using stream controller, we get a sync to write to one side of the pipe and a stream to read from. And there is also an additional pipe for errors. On the UI, we use stream builder uh, to get updates. Uh, stream builder has stream parameter and the UI is rebuilt when a new, a new value of snapshot arrives. And, uh, the, the snapshot is the latest state of the stream, and um, 
basically we had a look on the old terms uh, we need to implement block and um, now let's have a look directly on the uh, block imp implementation and how to put all these terms together block is the view model in mvvm application mvvm is software architecture pattern and it stands for model view view model uh, model saves data to storage and uh, contains some storage specific api calls view is a ui flutter or when i was starting my app it was a uh, angular dart and view model is a block and block has some strict rules block is a class and uh, the only interface it has is syncs inputs and streams ui modifiers or commands this means no fields no setters and no methods dependencies must be injectable and platform agnostic no branching is allowed in block you cannot write if the platform is android do this if web do that it won't work like that and data flows uh, from the ui to block from block to the ui ui using simple streams and syncs and simple means that you cannot use platform dependent constructions there are some rules for the ui as well each complex enough component has a corresponding block components should send input as is if we have a text field widget where user types some data we send it as it is we don't change it because it's already a business logic and um, if we get data from block it should be as close as possible to the output we are aiming to show all modification should happen in business logic and to have the whole picture let's see how block can be implemented in a standard flutter counter app a counter app has an incremental increment button and a text that displays how many times we press this increment button we have a class add block that has sync on add uh, an input for the um, increment button and a stream do set result and output for the counter text and in constructor we are listening for the input event when user presses increment button and when it happens we increment counter uh, value and um, put it in do set result stream on the ui we have floating action button our input that fires the increment by putting an event to on at sync and uh, we use stream builder widget to listen to do set result for this we assign do set result stream to stream to stream builder and every time a new snapshot arrives the text widget is rebuilt and new count value is showed now uh, let's implement a block in non-trivial app i've decided to take a dictionary app as an example and uh, let's have two screens first screen is a list of vocabulary and uh, the second add update screen for readability in my example i've used the following naming schemes for syncs and streams if the event is coming from block to uh, from view to block such as uh, user input event the sync has on prefix for example on back pressed and uh, when the block is making a change to a view the stream has do prefix such as do pop or do show validation result and i like starting my development from the end result and let's start with the view the first question is uh, how to initialize your view view model with block view does not populate any of its fields no setters no getters and block has to send initial data to view over a sync stream and view 
has to read it from stream. You can create a stream for every field to set them separately, or you can create a composite object with all view fields to set them all at once. But the composite object has some cons. It's needed to be composed in block, sometimes from multiple models, and needs to be uh, decomposed in view. Imagine a situation when the first data was changed um, by user and the second not, but the second data widget will still be rebuilt because of a new snapshot. Therefore, in the dictionary app, uh, we create a sync and a stream for every field. And uh, we have um, on word and on translation syncs as inputs for text field and the word in it and the translation in it streams as outputs to initialize the text field. Uh, on the UI, word and translation have text editing controllers, which are initialized in init state callback. And for this, we listen to do word in it and do translation in it streams. And when new data arrives, we update corresponding controllers. These controllers are assigned to text field um, for word and for translation. And um, when the word and the, trans and the translation are changed, we add events in syncs on word and on translation. And we have already at least two streams and two syncs exposed from block. Now let's talk about validation. When we create a word with translation, we still need to validate uh, that fields are not empty and depending on it, uh, disable or enable a save button. And validation happens in business logic. To provide a live experience, uh, we can run simple validation on every user input event, uh, such as text field, checkbox, slider, etc. And we have to show a validation error as well. We can create a separate stream for every field to show errors, or we can use existing um, streams and send validation error events to them. After that, we will be looking at a dirty bit. Dirty bit is a concept when the object was changed uh, from what it was at the beginning. Block is in a much better position to keep track of this bit since it knows which uh, UI elements are mutating the data and it also has an initial data to compare to. Therefore, dirty bit belongs to business logic, to the block. The next topic is the back button. The back button is handled by Scaffold. Scaffold is a widget that implements the basic material design uh, visual layout structure, and this class provides API for uh, showing drawers, snack bars, plotting action buttons, etc. To add business logic to when back button is pressed, we need to wrap the Scaffold widget with will pop scope widget and implement a callback on will pop. On will pop must return true or false statement. If you return true, uh, then current screen will be closed. Otherwise not. One mistake uh, to make here is to trap the user and prevent them from going back. For example, if validation fails, let's see how it can happen. We can go two ways from here. One is to silently autosave when user presses the back button. And uh, another one is to show confirmation dialog. Let's consider autosave scenario. To handle autosaving, you can uh, tell block to save information by writing it to sync uh, on, on will pop callback. Then you have to return false to not close the screen. In happy autosave uh, auto scenario, block saves the data and tells to close the screen. Here is how the flow looks like in the code. The view pings the block by sending empty data over a sync stream pair 
and immediately cancels close action by returning false. The block tries to save the data and pins the view over another sync stream pair to close the screen. But if validation does not pass, it generates an error to show to user and user cannot close the screen. Saving to database can sometimes fail, fail as well. And user is trapped in this screen. Because of the trap, user has a bad user experience. Another way is to show a confirmation dialog where the user wants to save changes. The same story with a will pop scope, but block tells the view to show a confirmation dialog if data was changed. To implement this business logic, block needs at least one thing that user leaves the screen and uh, two streams, one to show confirmation dialog and uh, another one uh, to leave a screen. What about saving data? If there are no validation errors, user clicks save button and uh, view writes to sync that we want to save the entry. Block tries to save the data. If it fails, block tells you to show an error to a user. If everything goes well, can we just close the screen as we do for back button? Not necessarily. When we add an entry, we cannot just leave a screen. Probably a user wants to add more vocabulary. And for this, uh, we need an extra stream to clear input fields and uh, also to set focus uh, to the first field. And uh, another problem is that saving data can take a little bit longer. Uh, and during this time, we should uh, disable the save button and show progress indicator to make sure that uh, user doesn't uh, smash the save button hundreds of times and uh, we didn't save hundreds of the same ob objects to database. And uh, to implement this, we need one thing, save button, and about two to five streams. Show error, close screen, clean fields, uh, show progress indicator, show confirmation dialog. And let's talk about localization now. In view, we show localized buttons, hints, etc. We also need localization in block to generate localized validation messages and uh, confirmation dialogues. And uh, localization can be changed in runtime. And therefore, we need an extra sync to update localized messages about validation and errors. Let's count how many pipes we need to save a word in the dictionary. In generic uh, case, we have at least uh, seven on save, on pop, do pop, do show error, do show confirmation dialog, on localization changed, do show progress bar, and to save word, we need more. Why not just one dynamically typed stream? Dynamic means anytime. Well, this is a viable approach that, that has different pros and cons. Pros, we don't need to dispose a lot of sync stream pairs. And cons, losing the benefits of statically typed language. It's easy uh, to forget to handle like a specific uh, case or to handle a type that is not, not, no longer present. And uh, it feels like re-implementing a type system. Block is easy testable. Uh, no dependency on Flutter, and um, no need uh, to run uh, emulator, and it makes it easy to, to and faster to test on CI. You just need to swap the models with more complementation. And uh, Dart testing framework has uh, rich support for async tests, including streams. Uh, thank you. That's it. Uh, for my presentation today. Excellent. Thank you very much, Katrina. Very informative. So uh, we will be asking questions at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of Rodi's talk. So um, I'm going to introduce Rodi now. Uh, so Rodi, 
Brody has uh, been developing lots of uh, live projects for us in recent times. Uh, he's also been uh, working on his podcast, the Creative Engineering Podcast. Um, mm -hmm. So Brody has been renowned for various li libraries, Responsive Scaffold, Breakpoint, Floating Search Bar, Flutter MIDI, File Access, just to name a few. And he's uh, <laughs> speaking about, <laughs> uh, now he's going to be speaking to us about how he actually uh, adapt, creates an adaptive UI for the new platforms that we have, which is web, uh, native, and of course, mobile. So I'm going to hand over to Rodi. Thank you. How's it going? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and not only um, desktop and web, but also we now have VR and some other things that'll be going on later. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is building adaptive UI UX, building for every device. Um, this you know, when we're working with Flutter applications, um, as with most of us, we kind of came from, you know, a mobile background. So, or at least some of us did. And then other people came from web, others from desktop. Um, but because of that, you know, the tools that we're given maybe only are optimized for one. So how do we build in a way that targets multiple screens? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. If you wanna follow along, you can go to this uh, URL and there's the demos that you can run in the browser. Um, as well as the source code that you can have. And of course, they can, we can have a link to this in the chat below. And this is uh, the GitHub. So what is the problem? Well, first of all, when you're working with Flutter applications and cross-platform frameworks in general, you're gonna have you know, your application run on a variety of contexts. You have you know, a laptop with a keyboard that's attached to it. You have an iPad, which is primarily a touch input, but now has a keyboard and a trackpad option. And some that only have a keyboard option or with an Apple pencil input, you have, you know, watches that have just like a two inch touch target. You have phones that vary in so many different sizes. Um, you have, you know, large screen form factors for, for desktop. You have even small netbooks, which are still desktop forms, but still have, you know, a small screen. You have things like the Pixelbook, which has a high um, DPI, but still a smaller screen. So, you know, you can't really predict in all the different ways that your application is going to be running. As well as, you know, we have uh, two in one computers that, you know, we they may start out one way while your application is running and change during the context. Um, and more recently, we have passive computing where you can actually, you know, talk to your application without even using any UI at all um, or even some minimal UI. So, for example, like this is, um, you know, the Lenovo um, smart screen or if you're working with Alexa or Google and just the, the all the possibilities that your application can be opened up to as well as something that people may not think about. It's like, well. You know, why do I need to care about, you know, a passive computing experience? Well, what about if someone can't see your application and they are um, they need some kind of accessible uh, way to access it? Well, one thing you do is make your app work in this kind of passive way where you can have this interchange with uh, the user uh, without displaying any UI. So like I did an experiment with my Tesla app where um, I use dialogue flow to take all the actions that you can use to control the car and then based on a string input or a voice input, you could actually control a car through voice. This is all in a passive context. So for the people that could see really well, um, I gave a chat mode, um, a cool different way to be able to control your car. And also, um, you know, we have folding phones now, like which we didn't before. We have things like the um, Microsoft Surface Neo coming out and, uh, you know, the Samsung folding phone and there's the Razer Fold. And there's so many different uh, types that we didn't expect as well as, you know, notches and whatnot. But I think Flutter does a really good job so far um, with building us the fastest UI toolkit that we can use to uh, create these experiences. So first thing that you may do when you're building an application is you uh, may start writing just like, okay, here's my desktop application. Here is my mobile application. Here's my, you know, my special admin application. And you start to really like, um, silo your application across different projects. Uh, the problem with this is, you know, you start having so much duplicated code. Um, so what are some things that we can do to fix this? First of all, we need to create a screen to stand on its own. Uh, an application should be able to be dynamic to the point where um, our screens are almost like view models and they only change based on the things that we provide them. 
Uh, we don't want to have these uh, so much business logic inside the screens that then we can't use that widget in another context. Um, because, you know, I used to do that all the time, but then I realized that my screen just may go in so many different ways that um, I wasn't expecting when I originally built it. Next, we, we only want to use the breakpoints that the parent gives. So this is, you know, with the constraint kind of layout in Flutter, instead of using um, the bottom up approach, we could just say, OK, uh, I'm going to give my my child this max size. And then the, the child, what it does is it just tries to be as big as possible and will change its layout depending on uh, what its parent is. Uh, the nice part about this is you can create this really complex layout that is it's self responsive internally. So you can have you know, a master detail scaffold with a nested master detail scaffold with a nested master detail scaffold, allowing you to have like multiple column layouts for having these list views. But then as you change the screen size, you can get a, a mobile and tablet size experience. Next, we also want to send events up and data down. I, this is pretty, um, you know, apparent, but uh, you know, we may not think about this when we're first building. We just may want to start with set state and um, we start to have this kind of almost spaghetti code. And what you want to do is, you know, Redux does this pretty well, um, except it's only a one way data flow. Um, but here we just use callbacks to send, OK, this this thing is pressed and then I'm also presenting this data. If you do it this way, this is very much the kind of view model approach, but it allows you to reuse a widget. Um, because it's just a dumb widget. It can it can be in whatever context it wants to be in, and you can wrap it in a smart widget, which is um, you know has the loading, the network library. But the the widget itself that you're wanting presenting, you want to have um, be as reusable as possible. As well as we want to save our breakpoints in a single location. Uh, this is also something I had to learn the hard way. Is you may just want to like set okay, let me just set a constant for a tablet breakpoint, and you go to another file, then you have its uh, some other different types of breakpoints, and then you start to like really mix and mingle um, all your breakpoints. But if you have a either a class or just a single place to put that, um, it's really nice to be able to modify them all at once. And we'll see later on why that'll be important as well. So here's just a, a simple example. We have a mobile view on the left and a tablet view on the right. Uh, things that you uh, may not think about when you first build this is, OK, well, the list view is shared across both of them. Uh, we have a detail screen that's only present on the tablet version. Um, and on the mobile one, we're going to push to that uh, detail screen. The floating action button is going to be a different location, but it looks like the app bar and a lot of this stuff are still the same. So looks pretty good. Um, but I think we can do better. So what, what's the code that actually does this? First of all, we have just a simple um, layout builder that will, on the tablet breakpoint, return the tablet size and, and a mobile size for the other one. But what are the trade-offs with this approach? Because there are some advantages to doing it this way, and we'll go over those. So the cons are that you have this duplicated UI code. Um, every time that you're, you know, you're writing this, it's going to um, start to really um, duplicate like your screen because you're going to have two different list views. And yes, you can internally, um, you know, save those out. But um, there can be start to be states that your app can be in that you may not expect. Um, it's really hard to refactor. So like if you want to, you know, change the list view, for example, you have to change it in multiple places. And maybe the way that the selection context um, and stuff like that, uh, different UI states. So like if you're on the mobile screen, and you're on an iPad, for example, and you resize up to a full screen, then it's going to have a different state because it's going to have a different item selected. As well as it's hard to test because mainly because of the um, duplicated UI code. So what are the pros to this approach? Because there are actually pros. Um, first of all, you have separate functionality. If you did want to have like, OK, this is my you know, desktop screen and I'm just going to optimize it for desktop and nothing else and then doing the same thing for tablet and mobile. Um, it's a quick solution because you can just set a breakpoint and then return a new screen. It's a clearly divided UI, meaning that this is desktop, this is mobile, this is tablet. And also you can you can kind of start to sort out like the advanced and basic features so you can have um, almost like flavors to your screens that you're wanting to present. So what is an example of an adaptive layout? So first of all, uh, an adaptive layout is going to change dynamically um, depending on the parent that it's uh, being provided. So here we have a list view 
that will you know navigate to the the detail screen, but then on a tablet version will um, select that item in the list view. So let's see that here. We can tap on it and then great. Um, so but how do we build this? Because um, right here we're only using one list view and only one detail screen. So how do we make it work on both? So this is where I'm um, coming up with uh, adaptive lists. And if you're coming from iOS, this is should sound pretty familiar because um, this is what the master detail scaffold is all about. What we want to do is pass the selection context up, meaning that when you tap on the item in the list view, instead of doing something right away, we're just going to send it up to the top of the widget and let the, the parent decide what to do with that tap. We want to push to the detail screen uh, when we're on a mobile device, but then we want to show the detail screen when we're on a tablet device. As well as we want to have a builder for the selection because um, we want to return um, the detail screen with new data each time that a new item is selected. As well as we want to, you know, we, the detail screen doesn't really care about the breakpoints of the parent. It only has its internal size that it, um, it is displayed upon as well as the adaptive screen can take multiple options for layout. So it can be used in other places. We can you know, just literally drag and drop this thing uh, wherever we need to. As well as we have one detail screen and one list view. This is really important. It means that we don't have any duplicated code. So let's just look at some basic code to um, see what we would do in this context for this adaptive list. Um, so as before, you know, we just have our, our parent widget, but let's Let's look down. So first of all, we have the default use case, which is our adaptive list, which shows um, we want to, you know, not automatically imply the leading, but that's uh, for the app bar. Um, we want to just, when it's on a mobile setting, we just want to navigate to the detail screen. Pretty simple. All we have to do is pass a selection context of the contact that is um, selected and then push. But then for mobile, what we do is check to see if it's greater than tablet and then on the, um, you know, for 300 um, pixels of the screen, we're gonna have the adaptive list, uh, which will have a floating act action button location changed, uh, which we can modify. And then we just updating a value notifier uh, with the new selection. And then on the rest of the screen, what it is is just a value listable builder, which takes that selection context and just, you know, shows the detail of the screen with those contexts. Keep in mind, um, the detail screen here is the same one but just with uh, different settings. And so the nice part is, you know, we don't have to duplicate anything. Um, everything is nice and um, dry. Next, I uh, wanna talk about interaction UI, because this is something else that changes across uh, when you have um, a cross-platform framework. So first of all, um, you know, desktop is gonna have a different experience than web, and web is gonna have a different experience than mobile. and you even have just these weird, you know, kind of crossovers where you have like a mobile web experience, which is kind of different than a native experience. Um, and, you know, some examples of that are like, you know, on iOS, you expect to see like an iOS alert dialogue. On web, you expect to see like web alert dialogues. And then on desktop, you know, it's depending on what you want to do. But um, what I mean is it's not the same experience everywhere. It's customized for the platform you're running on. So uh, one a nice thing that I've always done in my applications that I try to right out of the gate is just try to build for Cupertino um, in addition to material. Because if you're doing this, and for those that are not aware, Cupertino is the Apple and iOS style guide for um, creating these widgets, which Flutter has a great um, you know, library of them. But by doing this, you let your iOS users feel at home as well as your, your Android users. Um, now, of course, there's other design languages too, and you can implement as many different ones as you want. But um, some easy wins that you can get right out of the gate is any time that a Flutter widget supports dot adaptive, definitely use it. So like anytime you have a switch or a slider, or um, I think there's even like switch list tiles and stuff like that. And all these allow you to have internally under the hood, uh, the Cupertino for Apple devices and then material for everywhere else. We want to change the snack bar location. This is another easy win, but like, you know, like on a desktop, you don't want to have the snack bar be like the full width of your screen. That would be kind of crazy. Instead, you want it to be just, you know, a small normal size snack bar in a specific location. Same for the web. You may also have a different behavior on web where um, you don't want to just to show it and dismiss it. You want to let the user close it. 
where on a mobile device you do want to have it dismissed. And so there's just like little nuances that we got to be aware of. As well as we want to have a, a full screen dialog versus a pop up. So like on mobile device, we want to you know just show a full screen dialog. We don't have enough space to be able to do much more than that. But then on on a tablet, we want to have like a dynamically resized pop up that possibly can be dragged around because this is something that the user is expecting. And if they don't see that, they're just going to see all this white space and be kind of uh, turned off to that as well as we want to take advantage of the extra space just as before because you know we have you know it's you know when you're building this application for a desktop you know people can have their monitors really big and there's so much white space that just it makes your app look empty and unfinished so um, you need to look to ways to find um, how to fill that space in a way that makes sense and also is good for the user and you can also show a lot more on the screen. So especially with the latest in material design, there's a new density layout um, you know, key that you can add that allows your, your UI to change accordingly. So like if you're, um, for example, on a desktop, you can have it more dense, but then on a tablet, less dense. As well as like we can think about, you know, ways that we can multitask. So like on desktop, we can actually show multiple windows um, as well as the web, you may, uh, your app may live in multiple Chrome tabs or, you know, regular tabs. And it's something that mobile doesn't necessarily have, but it's still a very important uh, behavior for your application. And if you're curious, I do have a demo on how to do the multiple window thing. You can check it out on my GitHub, but um, it is possible with Flutter. And it's just, it's another way to take your application to the next level. So let's look at like just the, a poor experience on the tablet. So first of all, when you're, when you're on a tablet view, you're just going to, you know, have a, um, a full screen pop up and it's just going to take up the whole screen. And this, this looks really bad. So um, let's just see what that does under the hood. Well, first of all, we just have a settings icon, um, which then will show, or how do we fix it actually rather? This is, we're gonna have a dialogue that's gonna show an adapted dialogue uh, with our settings screen. Um, and this, this adapted dialogue will actually internally wrap um, our responsiveness for it. And our fallback is always going to be just showing a full screen dialog of the setting screen. So let's see what that experience would look like. Well, we have a, a nice settings dialog here. And um, like I said earlier, all these demos are available on that link. But we have like a nice responsive uh, modal dialog that will then if you if you go to um, narrow or to um, shallow, it will actually go full screen again as well as if you start with a mobile device, it will stay in a full screen context. Um, this is pretty powerful because it allows us to use existing widgets and screens in a way that um, makes sense dynamically because, you know, just because it starts off in a, um, a desktop, you know, view size doesn't mean it's gonna end up there. This is just an easy win that we can do. So uh, the, adaptive, the adaptive dialogue under the hood is actually pretty simple. And what we do is we just check to see if either side is less than um, our breakpoint, we want to return the child. Otherwise, we want to center that um, with the, the dialog size that we, we have predefined with an aspect ratio widget, um, and then the child, which will then um, shrink it down to where we need it. So this is really powerful. It allows us to have just a simple dialog. We just pass a child in, and we can make anything responsive like this. Next, we don't want to forget about dark mode. Um, yeah, uh, it was it was fun trying to figure out how to ways to support this before Flutter officially did. But um, yeah, this is something that is really important because you know you may think, well, I'm never going to use my app in dark mode, like light mode all the way. But um, the, the the side the other you know argument to that is you know if you have trouble seeing something, your app needs to perform in you know high contrast settings. Um, and one of the ways they do this is usually they invert the colors. And so, you know, this is very important because we need to make sure that we're not building for dark mode just because people want dark mode settings, but also for accessibility reasons so that people can, you know, use your app in as many ways as possible. And the user should be able to control the setting, but it's not always required. Um, Flutter now has a system mode, um, theme mode setting where you can actually set it to system. And then basically if the device has, um, dark mode on it will automatically switch to the dark mode theme or dark theme that you have in material app otherwise it'll go to light theme so these are both you know very important contexts it's just a quick demo where you can have you know just the colors if you look and see like like the reds are just slightly muted 
and uh, we have different hover effects as well as shadows. So um, yeah, definitely add dark mode. Next, we also want to build for platform UI. So um, in addition to interaction UI, we have platform UI. And this is like, so uh, Mac OS, uh, Linux, Windows, iOS, Android, and web. Uh, these are the specific contexts and domains that they exist in and how do we build for them. This could also extend to things like, um, you know, if we're building applications in VR or if we're building applications in the watch, how do we, these are all the platform specifics that we have to um, fix. And we definitely want to make each one feel at home. So uh, one simple thing that a lot of you run into when you first run your application on the web, you're like, wow, everything that I, you know, my application is running, but then like, you know, why don't I have like URLs um, to be able to like link to anything? And that's because you have to set up your application to support um, these various contexts. So one nice thing is if you use named routes on Flutter or on generate route, you can actually take advantage of this. Um, so if you're using everywhere navigator pushed manually material page route in your application, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of this. Put all that logic into on generate route and you'll be able to handle this. Um, you, there's also something that's kind of like different on the web that you may not be logged in when you go really deep into um, a screen. So like, you know, you may have a huge URL user, you may need to lazily load the, the user in, something that may be different than mobile. And of course this depends on the application, but just, you know, just be aware of it. As well as, you know, on desktop, we wanna support menus. Um, you know, this is also really powerful. It allows you to uh, have a file context to be able to like, you know, support keyboard shortcuts, shortcuts for that, but also just, you know, the user, some users just love browsing menus to see what all the application can do uh, when you have something selected or, you know, just seeing like a quick way to create a new file. So one easy way to do this is to use the menu bar package that's in desktop embedding. And then you can just literally do like command in, and then now you have a shortcut for creating a new file. Like if yours is a document um, application. So this is also pretty important. As well as we want to, you know, mobile, we want to support URL schemes. So like, you know, if our application runs on both the web and mobile, you know, if they click on something and it's the same URL scheme, it'll actually open up the mobile or desktop application. So this is pretty powerful. Uh, we also want to support native APIs as well as, you know, using established patterns out there. And, you know, like I said before, for Apple devices, you want to support Cupertino when possible because this allows the users to feel at home. And the same goes true for material design. You want Android users to feel at home um, because not every user knows exactly where to click. And you may have this fancy design on Dribbble, but then the user has nowhere, idea, nowhere to touch. And uh, that's just that's something we want to be very mindful of. So here's just a simple example. We have the settings dialog but we have material on the left and Cupertino on the right. And if you see, none of this is actually duplicated. Um, we're using just adaptive stuff under the hood and it allows you to um, use the same widgets in both contexts. Uh, one of my very early packages that I made for Flutter was called Native Widgets, which did this under the hood. I, um, I wrapped all kind of widgets and did both the platform implementations under the hood. So this is just an example of something you can do to you know, reuse and make your application feel at home wherever possible. Adaptive UI doesn't have to be spaghetti code. Uh, I know it uh, can seem like a lot, but it's really just about finding a pattern and sticking to it because, you know, things are going to change. Um, you know, new paradigms are going to come and go. New devices are going to come and go. But it's about building your, your application in a modular way that you can, you know, compose it together. So I think that's really important. As well as we want to have like dynamic layouts. Um, you know, we want to build a layout that the user can control. So think about something like VS Code, for example. You know, every time you open up a, um, a file in VS Code, you don't just have like a predefined location. The user can drag that around and put it in separate, you know, tiles. They can make multiple windows. They can have multiple tabs. And it's all up to the user. And uh, this is where I want to talk about giving control to the user for the layouts. You know, we build responsive layouts and we have to predict in as many ways that they can be used. But then also we can also hand that control over to the user to then let them take it even further because a user is always going to have some window layout that's going to make sense to them that not every user is going to like. And this way you can cater as many people as possible. We can also let each window have a full screen context. And um, the example I'm going to be showing is a golden layout library that I found 
that um, I recently rebuilt for Flutter. So let's look at this. Um, you can go to their website. I'll have the link on the repo. But basically, Golden Layout is this thing that existed for web, and it's a, it's a window tiling library. There's other frameworks that do this too. But it allows you to take a tab and be able to you know, resize it to any place. You can put it down in um, any location. You can close tabs. You can maximize tabs. And it's really powerful. Um, so one thing about this is like, just like VS Code, like the, um, the application doesn't set in a rigid way where all the windows can go. This allows the user to, based on their device screen, and see so it even supports pop-out windows, but based on their device screen, they can customize it however they want. So how can we achieve this in Flutter? So like I said, I created a library called Golden Layout, and it does exactly this. It allows you to, um, in a very quick way, be able to let the user you know, specify where they want their tabs. They can drag it anywhere they want. And of course, this is a, um, uh, I think the package was released like less than a week ago. So there's lots of stuff to be able to be improved. But you see, you can drag a, a tab from any one tab to another tab. And this, of course, is using like a, a tree data structure under the hood. Um, but you can resize both vertically, horizontally. They all um, can handle uh, wherever you want to um, have the tab live in. And of course, you can quickly close them. There's even ways to prevent a tab or window being closed. But just want to show you, this is this is just a simple way with just like just widgets under the hood to be able to um, give your layout anything. So if you have like a um, a complex desktop layout or like enterprise application that has a bunch of dashboards, I would definitely suggest looking at this library because this will let the user have total control. And you can kind of take away like some of the guessing game that goes into creating a complex layout, put it onto individual windows and let the user just select those windows. And then um, a nice way is they can kind of build their own layout as they make sense to them. And of course, the nice thing about this library too is the fallback is it opens up everything in a new tab. So by default, you just have like one big screen with a bunch of tabs across the top, just like a regular web browser. So um, even if the user doesn't want to have multiple windows, they can still have a very reusable way because the tabs are scrollable. So another thing, another package that I recently built was storyboards. And why would we want to do this, first of all? Well, we want to be able to build all your screens at once. Um, I know when I'm developing application, you may start with you know the login screen and then the home screen, setting screen, and then the about screen. And you have like four different screens. You're going back and forth between them. Um, and sometimes you can like start to forget about screens. You forget that you may have changed your you know theme met methodology. You may have changed like the way things look over here. Um, and then just in terms of consistency, you need to be able to watch them all at the same time. So uh, one thing you can do is you know edit your theme and watch all your screens update at once. So this is really nice um, with support with material design. You can just change the primary color and then everything changes as well as you can work with uh, dummy data. So I, I have the ability for you to add custom screens and custom lanes to be able to say, okay, I want this you know widget to be shown in a testing way to show this dummy data. So then that way you can you can have your protected screens, but then also show them um, in this dynamic way, as well as you know it supports all your routes in your applications. So um, this is just another uh, nice developer tool, um, as well as we can change our constants in one place and observe what breaks so um you know css you know would have this too where you can you know just change one line of css and it'll change some stuff but uh you know you can go to your constant file and then because this supports hot reload you know all your devices will change so you can change like your your breakpoints and then you can see what um flexes as well as you can test on different devices at once so you can have the same screen in multiple screen sizes so you can make sure that you want to support specific um specific sizes and make sure it works looks good on there so uh one thing for me was you know uh, always having to test on the iphone 5 because at the time my boss had an iphone 5 and so that was always a pain um as well as you know being able to support uh restart so i actually have a button now that'll restart your application uh which is pretty nice so let's look at an example uh here is the flutter gallery app running on a storyboard as you can see on the top app bar it actually picks up your um, theme and the storyboard will change depending on what you have there. So like all your colors and um, your fonts and everything. So what's nice about this is see, you can 
you can start to pick up so many things that you wouldn't have been able to pick up when you're testing your application, um, especially if you're like a QA engineer and you need to be able to test multiple screens at once and say, okay, are all these things look correctly? You can do widget tests. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff because this way you can basically multi-thread your testing if you wanted to, but it allows you to, you know, make sure that, you know, everything looks correct uh, because when you change something, you have to go, okay, let me go to the login screen. Let me go to the about screen. Let me go to the setting screen. And of course you can do golden file testing too, which you need to be doing um, and all of that. But this is just a nice way when you're building something really quickly, you can have it all up at the same time. And of course the link for this will be in the description. So something else I wanted to show you uh, real quick before my presentation is up, and this is my Flutter editor I've been working on. If you've been following me on Twitter, maybe you've been seeing a little bit of this, but um, making a ton of progress on it. So if you want to try it out for yourself, it's flutterweb.app, and um, there's the link there. So let's go ahead and check it out. So one interesting thing that I've been working on is a widget studio, allowing you to have you know a a storyboard kind of context for you know creating widgets. As you can see, the cursor is actually changing, and this is because under the hood, you can change depending on if you have the space bar or command key selected, um, as well as you know you have you can change your icons, you can have a PWA manifest generator, as well as being able to um, open up the project directly in VS Code. So this is all running on the web and creates a real Flutter application. So um, let me just let the GIF restart. But yeah, you know, what's cool about this is it allows you to uh, work really quickly in a prototyping way to be able to add multiple screens and um, edit your files. On desktop, it actually can compile your Flutter application. But uh, yeah, here we see we're using a native color picker, uh, which is really nice. And, um, and it's just like a really you know dynamic way. Here we can easily um, drop and create uh, widgets with just, you know, uh, really quickly, which is really cool. And then you can even control context, like when this button is tapped, launch the screen, show this dialogue, and all that kind of stuff is supported. So yeah, like I said, make sure to check it out in the link below. So what's the conclusion? Well, first of all, you got to embrace the change and just know that the devices we have now are not the devices we're going to have in the future. Things are going to be different. You know, we're going to have a new device that's going to come out next year that we're not predicting. And it's going to change everything we think about design and layout. And then, you know, things may also change, you know, like there's different, you know, there's desktop Neo, for example, is a really cool desktop thing that looks into the future to see like, how can we work with, you know, experiences. Fuchsia is another example, you know, with um, desktop and how do we change the way that, you know, we build our, U our, our UIs. And like, because it doesn't have to be static. There are, but the thing is also, we don't want to just like alienate our users because something changes. Uh, we wanna make sure that whatever we're doing makes sense, is not too drastic, but is always making progress. So first of all, create a pattern and stick to it. Um, this is really important. Um, whenever I start a Flutter application, I will, whatever pattern I'm choosing at the time, um, like for right now, I'm, I always have a very specific folder structure. I have a, um, a two different types of libraries that I go from. I either go with a, a uh, what's it called, a Flutter more and um, and basically shared preferences approach where I have a relational kind of data, as well as I also have, I've been using more recently freezed and um, a provider uh, in addition to value notifiers to be able to have this dynamic way. And it all depends on the data, first of all. Uh, but whatever pattern you stick to, make sure to go and finish your application with that pattern. It's always You're always able to refactor, but I would suggest waiting to refactor until after you've released the application. Your app can get into this like, uh, infinite cycle of just constantly changing it. And I know because I do this all the time, but is if you wait until after you release, then you can refactor, write your tests, make sure that whatever you refactor doesn't break your existing stuff. As well as we wanna extract widgets and components wherever possible. Um, a pro tip is if you were building your applications, build it with as much UI on the single screen as once without using methods, only after you finish the screen, then start extracting because it'll start to get really complicated with all the callbacks going up and down. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely do this because that way you can then use your widgets in um, wherever you want. Uh, a good rule of thumb is your only import should be Flutter material or the, the core library, so Dart Math and stuff like that. Because if you do, and you only support those, not only can you, you know, reuse them, 
but you can make sure that they are logicless, meaning that they don't depend on anything else besides Flutter. And then also you can use, you know, you just pass the data and then let it present. We also want to send all the actions up if we want to reuse the screen. This means passing up all the context for, you know, on tap, on long press, whatever we want to support for that widget. As well as we want to pass down the data. So this means every time that the data changes, we want to have the, the widget rebuild as well. Now you can have intermediate widgets that are smart and do the logic, like I said before, like if you have a widget that just wraps it with a stream builder and does everything, we want to make sure that um, that is done in a good way because uh, when you when you have that that layer and that separation, then you have like a kind of view model approach where you know you can change out the widget without having to change out the model and the logic. As well as we want to write dry UI code, because as with everything, the more code that we write um, that is duplicated, the harder it is to test, and the more places that we got to change it. So make sure that when you're doing this, you can build your application in such a a faster performant way that makes sure that we're not you know, duplicating anything, as well as, you know, just building an application that can run in multiple contexts. Um, you know, like I said before, not everybody builds with the cross-platform mindset in mind, but this is important because we have such a powerful toolkit, uh, which is Flutter under a hood. And if we're not like taking advantage of it, then why are we using a cross-platform framework? If you're only using Flutter to build like an iOS application or an Android application, then I feel like you're only taking like advantage of like 5% of what it can offer you. So um, make sure to uh, go to this link if you want to see the examples. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, GitHub, and of course you can reach out to me on email. Um, and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, let me know. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rody. Very, very interesting stuff you've been working on. I'm sure you're a part machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de it. definitely. <laughs> he's, he's the hero that we need. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got some questions. Um, so first question, we're going to go to our banners here. So one for Kate. Uh, let me, hang on, is that one? Yeah, so what design pattern yeah. would you say Block is similar to? Katerina. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm here. Um, so design patterns uh, i hope it's uh, like state management patterns so if it's uh, about architecture to, uh, so i'd like to say it's uh, mvvm or mbc and if you'd like to compare it to other state management approaches um i think uh, flutter block has some similarities with a uh, block because like but um, the difference is that you um, green classes, one for Cupertino and the other for Material. No, I uh, I always extract whatever widget that I'm wanting to wrap for whatever platform. So I'll have like my custom button, and my custom button will internally show the different types of buttons. So the Cupertino button, the Material button, and um, whatever kind of special button I want to show under the hood. So. Okay, since you, uh, Katarina, since you mentioned uh, Flutter Block a moment ago, what is the difference between Flutter Block and the block pattern? That's from various uh, commenters. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Flutter Block, like, is more like Redux, uh, like from my point of view, because uh, basically you like dispatch an event in Flutter Block, like, and after that you send something back and uh, it's state and uh, in um, with block pattern you basically wor work with uh, stream streams and syncs and uh, it's uh, like a difference you don't work with uh, like states or something like this and you um, may have completely different approaches for example you can uh, like um, have like a block that only handles small part of the UI and um, gets like some updates and uh, this like updates are simple objects. So would you say that a block is per complex UI element then or a block is for the whole screen in your approach? Um, so in my private project I used a block for the screen but it also can be splitted 
first and like um it's more it can be like yeah if it's like complex ui it can it it can have different blocks okay Brody, what is golden layout oh, yeah okay. golden yeah, Golden Layout is a tiling library uh, that exists on the web. Um, and then, so basically, I rebuilt it in Flutter. Didn't use any of the code, actually. I had to completely do it from a Flutter kind of way because it actually worked on JavaScript to be able to support you know web. On my version, it's actually just using flexes under the, the mm -hmm. hood, um, expanded in columns. But yeah, it's a, it's a way for you to have a controller, just say, add a screen and a tab, mm -hmm. and it does everything for you. But isn't Golden Layout something that comes from design where when a person looks at a page, it's the way that the human eye scans the page? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it originally came, like the the uh, idea came from, because you could have a internal spiral. So, mm -hmm. Golden Ratio. <laughs> that's the one, Golden Ratio. <laughs> yes. So, do well, any of you use main driven design and clean in your apps? Domain driven as uh, what is that? In what context? Design. Uh, well, I, I would presume that they're referring to Scott Wallachian's uh, uh, philosophy on on the way that um, uh, you would construct your your data, and it's mm. the way it's consumed within the apps. Yeah, I'd use a lot of layers in my applications if that's what they're asking, because I do follow that architecture. Yeah. Okay. I also use uh, layers uh, like in my project, like UI block and uh, after that a repository uh, and uh, like models to access database. Okay. All right. So the next one is for Katarina. Do you use any dependency injection for a, like for your projects like get it or provider? Which one do you prefer? I don't use both of them. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I use nothing from this. Okay. Okay. Next one. It's for Roddy. It's a long one. So, <laughs> so if you're oh, yeah, on the yeah. DTS screen, and if you resize it, it resize at that point to a tablet. It does not automatically pops the navigation stack to show the list and details simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. So I think what they're asking is if you resize down to a tablet it's not popping back. Yes, uh, that is because yeah. if you go to the detail screen, in that context, for example, if they're on an iPad, they are on the detail screen. They're not in a, you know, a different context. We don't want to do anything until after that is the user has done an interaction. Um, on, you know, inversely, if they are on the list screen, and then they go to a tablet size, they'll see the detail screen for the previous one they selected. So this is just uh, part of the UX um, and things that you have to like, same thing for the dialogue. If you show a full screen dialogue, it's not going to change after the uh, after the fact because they started with that in the mind. Okay. Actually, it's for everybody nowadays. Okay. Are there some advantages of using blocks of something like Mobex or Pro Provider? Well. I think it all depends on the data. Um, many people start to choose state management solutions before they know what kind of data they have under the hood. Um, you know, if you're dealing with anything that needs queries and relational kind of stuff, then you're going to need to go with something like SQLite or you know Flutter More, for example. If you're if you need something that is you know under redo a one day data flow, uh, Flutter Block and Block are really good examples of that. But if you want just like a a, a strict you know unidirectional flow. Um, you know, Redux is perfect. Um, and same with MobX. It just really depends on the data, in my opinion. In my opinion, uh, like, what to choose is it depends on project as well. And uh, when I was um, starting this blog, uh, provider wasn't released at this time. And uh, I think MobX as well. So it was like to, to use inherited widgets or like some state management that were before. Scope model, yeah. Yes, scope model, exactly. I would agree with Rodi as yeah. well. It does depend upon the size of the application that you're building, because you might not need to go full on block or full on MobX or full on Redux. It really does depend on what you're looking for. If you're building an enterprise application that may need to be tested, then it may be worth working with block, you know, so something that can actually be broken down and elements can also, be tested. 
Ready? Todo es de... Sorry, I think you froze. Yeah, I think so. What'd you say? Frozen. Yeah. Sally, you froze there for a moment. What'd you say? Okay. Yeah, can you... Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I said, uh, like, I think it depends on also the experience and what you have. <laughs> I would say that's fair. Anyway, I will shut up. George, go for it. <laughs> so Ronaldo asked, Katrina, I've been using Block with Stream, but using methods instead of sync, any comments, pros or cons on it? So, um, yeah, I mean, I was following the rules that were, like, um, presented at DartCon 2000. 18 of block pattern and here like using uh, methods it's kind of losing a sync approach I, I'm, I would agree as well I, I would tend to use the stream approach but in my opinion calling a method and then passing something in for example when you need to you can create the stream inside the block itself as well so for some people, it might be preference. Again, it depends upon what kind of project you're working on and what the team agree on. So, Rodi, how is your multi multi platform setup? Uh, debugging multiple devices at once or focusing on one at a time? Uh, this is actually why I built the storyboard. So, um, I was going down the approach of having multiple emulators running at the same time. Um, but then I built a storyboard so I could actually just have all my screens up at the same time with one variable change the layouts, um, as well as being able to have the same screen across multiple. Um, basically, you you have the advantage of only having one Flutter engine running, only one context to hot reload into. And for me, it like greatly sped up what I was doing. So yeah, I just use a, a Mac OS application, full max of my full screen with my storyboard. So if you have made a change and you need to restart the whole application, how do you go about that? There's a button now in the storyboard that can restart the uh, the application. But that what does that run inside the code? Uh, it'll create a new key for your material app, so then it'll throw away your state. If you you can, it still supports hot restart and hot reload as well. So okay, but when it throws away state, say for example you are using provider and multi provider, and you're setting up your Firebase and things like that, would it actually refresh those as well? It'll start it as if you started from run app again, or at oh. least until you start your your main application. So it's pretty interesting. All right. So uh, I have a question here. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Uh, Katharina, Block evolved during the last two years. Did Block evolve in the last two years? <laughs> um, so it's an interesting question. I think uh, sync and streams uh, functionality basically didn't change. Um, so it's pure Dart, but um, as an like improvement for block implementation, it's also uh, good to use Rx Dart. Okay, so uh, Rodi, oh, at Rodi, is rebuild stateful widget widget when Windows resize in web, for example? Um, no, not under the hood. That's why usually I'll use like a layout builder. So it will just rerun your build method inside the stateful widget uh, when your screen size changes. You don't have to actually rebuild your state of the stateful widget itself. The state stays in the same context. Okay. All right. We have a few more questions left. So at Rodi, uh, I'll show this one. All right. So what about tree shaking? Yeah, it's important. <laughs> 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 yeah. Can't be quite. And then uh, this one is for Katrina. Uh, do you use Flutterblock, or do you think it is unnecessary and is easy enough to make your own? Uh, yes, I use Flutterblock at work, and um, it's um, it works well, and I like it. Uh, code is um, structured, and it's easy to find. Um, business logic and uh, where to add analytics so it, if you like to move from blog to flutter block it was uh, easier for me all right so i think we're going to go for a little break now before we have uh, the general q a we've got some other people joining the team that's going to be a little bit of a surprise so uh what, what time is it now in the uk it is now five to nine 
So let's come back at 9 p.m. Uh, I don't know what that time is in your time zone. All right, so we'll talk to you soon.
Hello, hello, hello. <coughs> hello, everybody. So, as mentioned, we've got some special guests. We have Martin Ryback from Flutter, New York. We are truly an international meetup this evening. We have Matt Carroll, ex-Flutter uh, team member. And Rody's joining us. And, of course, we have Simon, Flutter Whisperer. Uh, waiting for that. <laughs> How is everyone? We're doing fine. Thanks for doing joining good. us. Yeah, great job, guys. Really love the talks. Thanks. It's definitely uh, definitely fun controlling the stream behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Learning some new gear. Okay, puppeteer. So I think we actually had a couple of questions come in, but we I, I kind of want us to just to chat about what's been happening the last few weeks. I know rody has been very busy doing podcasts with Norbert. I still have not got yeah. through all of them. I'm still <laughs> stuck on number two. I'm, I'm sure I'll get there eventually. Why haven't I heard about this? Is it getting uh, yeah. on Twitter? Yeah, it is. I, yeah, I think this is time for a link on screen. Hang on a second. Wait, yeah. send, me, send me the link, Rody. Send me the link. Yeah, I will. Yeah, and I'll get it's that. Getting pretty there. popular. Um, I, 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 I heard that the first. Uh, hey, there, there he is. There he is. <laughs> uh, I heard that my um. Uh, oh, hang on a minute. Do I have a link? Yeah, I'm facing it right now. There we go. We've, we've lost someone. Oh, George. Oh, oh Salih's coming in. Yeah. Hello, Salih. <laughs> <Welcome, welcome. laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, for anyone that wants to know, here is the link. Hopefully, they'll get into the they'll get into the chat, and uh, I'll put it on screen as well. And uh, we did actually get a couple of. Um, we don't actually get there. It is. It's on the screen for anyone that wants yeah. it. It's a bit of a long link. We should. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if I you get. Can just search creative engineering. Yeah, you yeah. can search it. What, what's it called? Creative engineering. Creative engineering. There you go. I think that's that's probably it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a link there on go. the Flutter London meetup for this event to the your podcast. Oh, there okay. You go. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Truly international now. Yes. Um, uh, so, so, uh, I wanted to bring up a topic. So, um, at Flutter Europe, we kept getting questions about, uh, an upcoming event. Uh, are we going to do hack 20? And the answer is yes. Uh, we've been hard at work specifically, uh, Martin and a few other people have been helping us out trying to, trying to organize this thing. And uh, we've launched a website. The website is now live. Uh, it's flutterhackathon.com. I'll put the link on the screen. Um, please go there. Um, we, what we're looking for right now is for people to suggest their themes. So uh, we want to get the community to contribute here and give us feedback. And hopefully we'll come up with some a good theme selection and we'll do rounds of themes. So this week we'll ask for everyone's input. And then next week we'll give you a new form which has a smaller set of, of options. And eventually we'll get to have a final selection on the day. And that will denote what the theme is and what we're going to work towards. So uh, go check it. Go check it out. Um, I'll put the link on the screen. Woo! Yay! Dope. Oh look, I got a hash from my. Yeah, <laughs> mm. no hash. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So if, uh, if if you guys remember last year around uh, June, we had the uh, the first ever international Flutter hackathon. We had about a thousand participants uh, in 69 hubs across 35 different countries, and it was a it was a total blast. Uh, really amazing to watch uh, the whole world uh, on that big map uh, participate. So, yeah, this year we're doing the same thing, um, but it's going to be online only. So it's going to be interesting and challenging, but it's going to be fun. And uh, definitely uh, go to that site and vote on uh, some ideas that you'd like to see there, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, there's also a mailing list so if you want to get the updates on the exact dates which we'll be releasing soon uh sign up for mailing list and we'll send out a notice for everyone so matt hello welcome Simon. welcome hi it's good to see you good to see you i i had some interesting news just just this other day uh what's what's going on all right well yeah just yesterday and uh, i'll bring martin in on this too uh, we announced a collaboration between my Flutter education effort called Super Declarative and Very Good Ventures. Uh, we're actually offering remote corporate Flutter training 
for any companies around the world that want to bring their team over to Flutter. That's awesome. I need, some, I need some fireworks animations next time, right? <laughs> yeah, you guys brought the production system, so I don't know where your particle effects are, but you got to get them yeah. going. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've we've seen a ton of interest from our, our clients uh, about uh, getting their teams uh, leveled up on Flutter. And um, you know, Matt, uh, your your history in this space is uh, is epic, and and we're really happy to partner with you to bring this to um, to any 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 corporate client who is interested. So if you guys have that need, um, or if you know of anybody who has that need, definitely um, let them know. Yeah, and we uh, we did train a couple of clients uh, over the past month or so, and I think both of those were great successes. They're up and running with Flutter. Uh, they learned all the all the fundamentals in a matter of days, and so I think we're on a good track, and we're looking to carry that to any other companies that are ready to convert. Because the sooner the the whole world goes to Flutter, the sooner we can you know lock it in. That's right. <laughs> So we did actually get a couple yes. of questions earlier about um, some various things. So I might as well pop one up on the screen. Oh, oh no, no. That's not... There we go. Uh, what is going on? The software's breaking on me. Right at the vital time. Uh-oh. Let's try that again. Hang on. Let's see if this works. Job opportunities. There we go. Um, we keep hearing this, right? We keep. I think. I think, to be honest, the job opportunity market has got bigger for especially for flutter like as flutter becomes more popular we see more job and opportunities available um i'm hearing big companies asking now for, for to fill positions for an interest in jobs and as we know that since there's education now happening with big countries are going to be wanting to fill those flutter positions um if anyone doesn't know there's uh, uh flutter uh, i mean flutterjobs.info um i forget her name i'm terrible in names She's never going to forgive me. Uh, there's, there's a there's a great woman that actually set that site up, and it's been running for I think a year and a half now, at least a year. Yep. And it's been the go-to place for for getting jobs, and mainly it's for uh, a lot of it's for cost of sort of freelance slash contractor positions. Um, hopefully, we we'll start seeing more full-time positions being listed. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else have any remarks on that? Uh, just the fact that like. Pretty much any place you go into with a cross-platform job, usually Flutter's a pretty easy sell. Um, even if you start native, um, I worked at a place where we transitioned to Flutter as part of that, started as a regular mobile dev. So even if you don't see a specific Flutter job opening, usually just having Flutter knowledge and having an option for cross-platform is usually pretty big. Let me just expand on that topic a little bit. Uh, let me go from the people that are looking for jobs to those of us who you know are kind of building things and maybe we already have positions with flutter but this is this is a responsibility for all of us i think that it's it's largely i mean flutter i think we all know is a superior technology in terms of productivity effectiveness and all these things but what we have to do is demonstrate that to enough of the world that they're willing to take bets on apps where they've spent millions of dollars already building it to now kind of transition it to this new technology. And so everything we do, whether it's blog posts, podcasts, libraries, anytime that we add something to the ecosystem, it's either going to make us look more cohesive and in line and effective, or it's going to have the opposite effect. So just keep that in mind with whatever you're doing. Let's make Flutter the easiest to access, um, most attainable technology solution out there, and it'll be adopted and there will be many jobs. Uh, but if we don't do that, then maybe it won't. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, another point is uh, is like make your own opportunities too, right? Don't just wait for the job listings to come. Like if you feel strongly about Flutter, sell it. Sell it to your own company uh, or sell it to the company that you want to work for, right? Make the case. Uh, tell them to, to, to do it. Maybe you can do a little bit of a POC um, for free up front just to kind of show them how... Uh, how productive you can be, um, and that way you're kind of making your own your own job, right? Um, and I think that's how a lot of us uh, got started. So, yeah, don't always wait for the listings. Uh, so it looks like Scott has sent in a question for Matt. That's uh, probably actually a better question for Martin. Would you like to comment on that? Um, let's see. So uh, both companies that we uh, trained were financial companies. They were they were mid sized, so I think they had on the order of. Uh, on a couple of hundred employees. 
Um, and they were, they were innovators in the financial space, so they weren't necessarily encumbered by lots of uh, legacy tech. Um, but in both, actually in one, in one company, it was a greenfield project, and the other one, it was um, they were trying to replace a legacy native mobile app that had uh, gotten a little crusty uh, over the years uh, with both native iOS and Android. Um, so the interest that we're seeing is primarily from, I would say, like the, the smaller to medium-sized companies. I think the larger ones are still kind of set in their ways. And, um, you know, we're still trying to, uh, to, to pitch them on, on the values and benefits of Flutter. And eventually it will happen. It'll, it'll, from all the pressure from within and also from, from the outside, I think eventually they're going to they're gonna feel it as well. This does kind of lead on to that kind of notion of, uh, I think we've all had this sort of like, why can't I just code my app in Kotlin? Like, like we have this from the existing developers and we're just trying to get them to just, it's just literally just, please just try Flutter. You won't <laughs> regret it, right? It's just, just, just try it at least for a couple of weeks. Just try this thing out. Even just one evening, just try it out. And I'm sure you'll just be opened up to new opportunities, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from what I've seen, the, the companies, the larger ones that, that have succeeded in this took a very um, analytical approach uh, when it came to pitching this to management, right? So they would come up with a, a list of the pain points and, and all the frustrations and the slow velocities that they're experiencing um, and the bug counts and things like that. Um, and then they made a uh, proposal that if we could create um, a sort of proof of concept and they came up with a rubric uh, by which to assess uh, the, the outcome of that POC uh, and everybody agreed on it. Everybody said, okay, if the outcome of this survey is is a positive, then we are going to move ahead with Flutter, right? So it's like taking a very like scientific approach to this. So it's not just emotions and opinions, but okay, what are the facts? If we demonstrate that we can improve on these dimensions, right, then uh, management agrees to buy into it. You know, that's a very good approach to take. So there's actually a couple more questions here about training. Uh, let's see what we can bring in. There you go. Do we can we release this information then? <laughs> I think we can at least we can at least talk in yeah, general. Talk sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think on our post we do mention at least at a high level what the topics are. So we're going to come in early on in the training with you know how do you paint pixels with Flutter? Uh, how do you change the UI over time? How do you process user input? The the fundamentals that everyone needs. We're then going to go from the fundamentals into application UIs. So these are uh, these are layouts that you expect to see in a typical mobile app. And then we'll come around and we'll do some platform topics. It could include state management, um, networking, uh, platform integrations. We have a number of topics in that area. So that's kind of like we have three days and those are kind of the three major topics that we, or three major focal areas that we go into. And Martin, would you like to add anything to that curriculum discussion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like Matt said, we go into some of the more detailed topics, like all the different scrollable type of widgets. Uh, we go do a deep dive into Navigator. Um, as far as state management goes, um, we do have a couple of modules um, that are customizable you know, per the client request. We have a module that uh, goes over provider uh, and kind of what you heard today um, uh, about uh, the history of, of uh, state management in terms of like scope model and, and, and block uh, as, as a general uh, concept. Uh, and then provider. Uh, we also have a specialized module because obviously Felix Angeloff, the creator of Flutter Block Library, actually you know works for our company, uh, so he definitely um, is the right guy to give those talks uh, on on Flutter Block. So if a client comes in saying that they want to use Flutter Block, we definitely provide them with a module that's that's hyper focused on that. Um, but we don't necessarily uh, always do that in every in every scenario. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this off of training for a minute. Um, I've got a very important question. What about the semicolons, guys? This is a very important topic that needs to be covered by all these people in this room. Okay, okay, I want hands up. Who wants semicolons? I love them. Oh, three gets I, where, two. Oh. Where, where <laughs> I don't care at all. Yeah, I, yeah, I like them optional. To, 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 to be honest, um, from is my Scott, Scott, are you holding a flamethrower right now? <laughs> um, so I, I have to be honest, right? This is. This, question comes up quite often right and I, it doesn't bother me right it, either way however there is a little bit inside me that says i know the way the passing engines work and it's like the semicons really do help and there's some oh, yes. ambiguous yeah uh, ambiguation of statements that can happen that you just don't expect and they're the situations you 
Do you want one more headache? As a developer, we do not want more headaches. So I kind of, in, in, one little bit inside me goes, we should keep Timmy Collins. It yeah. just, what's the problem, really? <laughs> Personally, I think that there is a, a good compromise that we can do is, uh, we have Dart of MT, so we could technically uh, use Dart of MT to kind of autocomplete the semicolons when obvious, so that the users don't have to type the semicolons, but we still have them. Is it really? Is it really that problematic to press an extra key? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not convinced. Well, no, me, it's not. But yeah. many people want to not type it, so we could technically do that. I mean, JavaScript does it with Prettier, so. We could have the same tooling. I also like think that it's also a bigger question too of like, you know, inferred enum types too, like in Swift oh, yeah. where you can just do like the you know the dot syntax. Stuff like that, I think just um, where it's optional makes it really nice. There's definitely some syntax sugar that could go into Dart that could really improve things. I think they're gonna get there, but the problem is it's the the, the big all consuming thing that the Dart team is working on is the non nullable by default. Way and more important. It's way more important than anything else. <laughs> yeah. So Let's let's go for that first, and then we can see what happens after that, right? Um, Definitely. Oh, uh, Dominic's Dominic's posted a question here. Uh, he Dominic was presented this on the stream. Um, how do we feel about the current state of Flutter packages? There are thousands of them, but a large fraction are abandoned, or and it still keeps ninety plus score on pub. Is pub going to become npm of Dart? I did actually retweet about this the other day, so I saw an article that was written that basically said there's I think over a million packages now in npm, and like basically most of them are like just just garbage garbage <laughs> like, yeah and i was like it, it, there was another breaking oh did you hear this there's another breaking one uh so you know that do you remember that array length package that broke like loads of javascript yeah libraries they did a there was a similar package that happened the other day that everyone used for like like the really simple operation in javascript and it just broke yeah. the package the http thing. package library did yeah that one they they deprecated yeah, that was it. So that, but that's the real crux, right? I mean, we focus on the number of packages, but the the things that people kind of lose their minds about is when someone created a package to like output, I don't know what, a commented message in the console when something happens, and then half <laughs> the world depended on it, and then it got then it got removed, and everything broke. So it, maybe if we just don't build unnecessarily tiny, inconsequential libraries that everyone depends on, maybe it's not a problem at the end of the day. Well, also, like you can deprecate packages on pub that everybody knows about. So that's really nice. So if you're not working on a package actively they anymore, like everybody, right. yeah. yeah. And then, and then also too, um, that's kind of like the whole concept around the Flutter community as well. That these kind of core packages we can kind of put in, and then you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, like it's like you know, if someone stops working on something, like we can have other people that can submit PRs and publish updates. And that's what the domains are really nice. I, I mean. I, I specifically don't publish packages now, right? So I've got gists now that just are just a mile long of all these little different samples and snippets of things. Cause they're just like normally in Flutter, it's just like normally like 10, 15 lines, like it does this nice little quirky thing that really solves a problem for you. Do I want to make a package for this like one single right. dart file and then have to maintain that, have to do PR and that like don't just copy it stick in your project. I kind of, there's, I feel like there needs yeah. to be a level about this, right? Don't get me wrong, I'm not being ridiculous about this, right? But there's Golang does this, uh, Golang has, I think the authors of Golang, I, f I forget their names, but um, one of the things that they said in, in their stuff was, if, you, if you've got this one line solution to, to, or, or simple solution, copy into your project, don't depend on an outside library mm -hmm. because you do get into those problems where you have all these dependency issues, right? So obviously you still need test cases, you still need other things, right? But you have to draw, I feel like you have to draw a line somewhere. Right, that that yep. it is too ridiculous to say import a simple a simple thing. Right. It also seems yeah, like but... we should we should create our own version of gist that automatically brings in Dartpad. Yeah. Right. I've done it. Um, it's pretty interesting. I, I, the uh, the API is pretty nice. The, at the same time, I personally don't necessarily dislike small packages. I think uh, it's uh, mainly a responsibility of. Uh, people using this package to not just use thousands of stupidly small packages. Whereas, um, I mean, maintaining nerves publishing small packages is not necessarily a problematic in itself. Uh, as uh, a package may be small in the beginning, it may, it may grow over time. Maybe in two years, it will be huge. I mean, for example, Provider is one of these. I mean, two years ago when it started, it was like maybe a hundred lines, and now it's used by almost everyone. So if we, if we are like uh, 
still do small packages, then we are losing a lot of opportunities on having this whole stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's about. I don't, I don't think the size is what matters. It's it's what's the value that's created by the package. So the package does something for you for sure. Use it, but if you just need left padding on a terminal <laughs> output, you d yeah, copy the for loop or something. It, you don't need a package for that. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, totally. I'll also point out that a lot of the enterprise clients that we work with are generally hesitant to use packages. Yeah, um, and so I think I think a lot of people don't understand, right? When you do it, when you release one of these big pack, when you release one of these big products for a corporation, there's a big set of forms that go behind it that says, "Do you depend? What dependencies do you have? What licenses do they have? Are they going to be oh, compatible with our yeah. licensing scheme?" Yeah, there's a whole exactly. set of stuff that goes behind using all these external yeah. dependencies, right? Yeah, yeah, the licensing, the uh, also doing a security audit of the code, right? Yeah. I mean, there could be something in there that's sending uh, you know, your keychain over to uh, to some remote place, and you don't know. I mean, so not that the community is doing this, but I think that you know, I don't think there's anything uh, preventing that kind of code from from getting published, right? In, in a self publishing environment like like pub. So the, just the, just keep keep that in mind, right? Just just be be vigilant at all times. I, I will see if I can find it. There is actually an email address for the pub team to report packages that are being malicious. So mm. uh, I will dig the out and put that in the description after we finish. Yeah. But uh, as far as I know, uh, Google's not uh, doing any any analysis on on, no. on the on those packages. So uh, is GitHub though? I think it is, right? Sorry? For security? GitHub. GitHub yeah, GitHub GitHub, GitHub, but it's not like that, right? It doesn't know that yeah. a certain how Dart syntax is and like it's other oh, right, yeah. I don't think it doesn't even doesn't do data analysis yet. Like you know, with like mm. Java, you can do the analysis and it jumps you around and stuff, right? I don't know. Mm. Um, so here's one Dominic said. Um, so this is specifically talking about Flutter Web here. Do we agree that Flutter Web landed on beta a bit too soon? Um, and it seems still a bit of a worse situation than Flutter on Mac in terms of performance tooling. To be honest, like like Flutter Web, what do you guys have? You guys you've has one here been trying Flutter Web? I have specifically over the last sort of month. I've been using Flutter Web. I have a production app with it. Uh, Amstor is running Flutter mm -hmm. Web. There you go. I mean, some literally, some. I think I saw a tweet or a question today that was like, someone said, "Is it ready for production? Can I use it in my production?" I'm like, "Go ahead if you want to." I mean, like, the thing is, it's open source. So if you get any bugs, fix them, right? I mean, yeah, that's what I have to do. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I mean, I pushed back a few PRs on on Flutter Web recently, and I'm like. Too soon. I mean, does it do what you need it to do, right? That's the question. If it does, then it's good. <laughs> ah. Yeah, and it's a question of what's the metric? Because beta doesn't mean stable. It very purposely sure. doesn't mean stable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would assume that whatever the beta definition is for the Flutter team, they're adhering to it. And so you might disagree with that definition. That's very possible. But I would bet that it meets whatever the specific enumerated list of capabilities are that the Flutter team deem necessary for the beta label. It, it does make it does also make me wonder some of the, one of the other things that I I I I specifically went for with Flutter was I was pushing for clients to use the beta of Flutter before it became stable. In the in the fact that what actually happened was the time it took to develop the, the products took us into the final release of stable. So I kind of feel at this point you could probably start developing depending on your obviously your product timeline you could start developing with the aim for getting all these patches in and getting all these things in before you release. There, when a, Dominic said, said that, it's, that it's marketed as if it was stable, um, I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. I haven't seen that personally. I haven't seen the Flutter team come out and say, this is production ready or you should I use it. He was just saying that that uh, Flutter web um, it is is in a worse situation than desktop, Mac OS desktop, but they're both beta. So is Flutter web yeah. really alpha? I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. But I don't know. It really depends. I mean, I mean, you, if you go back to two years ago, uh, Flutter was in beta, but a lot of, of uh, things changed, and it was still in. I mean, a lot of things wasn't there two years ago when it was in beta, but uh, the beta status, in my opinion, was still uh, a valid status for what it was at that time. We could, we can. Uh, and I think the same logic applies with the Roy point right now. Uh, there are still things missing and still things not ideal, but uh, the core of the logic is there. You can definitely, if you want to build a website, you may have to do extra components, do some things that, that are not necessarily built in, 
but you will be able to do something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The other thing to think about um, strategically, right, is uh, in this space, right, with SPAs and, and progressive uh, and um, progressive web apps and and uh, WebAssembly and Blazor and all these technologies, right? Like, like there there's a lot changing real 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 fast, and and if and if uh, the FAR team waits too long, uh, they could potentially miss the boat, right? So. Uh, I'm actually very pleased that they put it out when they did uh, to get people used to it, yeah. uh, that, that it's out there, kicking the tires, fixing bugs, right? And and getting that mind share, right? Is that, okay, there is this uh, this um, this web uh, output outlet for, for Flutter code. Um, and, and to kind of, you know, that that knowing that now may alter our investment decisions, right? As companies, right? Um, so we may not invest in, in some of these competing technologies. If we know that Flutter Web is there, it's just getting better and better, right? So I think I think they're doing the right thing strategically. Um, whether technically, you know, it, 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 it you know checks off all the boxes, you know, it might not be there just yet. But the point is that it's out there and we're able to, to test it and play with it. And I think it's a good thing. I'm still waiting a lot on uh, Darkpad allowing packages. Uh, because, uh, I, yeah, that would be so cool. Yep, packages and, and assets and stuff like that. Yep, can't do that. Hey, gang, we had a question here earlier about uh, VR. So can you tell us a little about how you see it being used with Flutter? Yes, so under the hood, you can, there's actually two competing, not competing, but two different types of technologies that you can use with Flutter and VR. So um, for those that are not aware, WebXR exists on the web. It's an API allowing you to create like augmented and virtual reality experiences on the web. Um, you can use this with existing Flutter web applications. And there's a cool, you know, framework called A-Frame, which allows you to do all this stuff. Um, and I've been experimenting with this like hybrid approach of Flutter where you can like have these views that are VR that you can enter into, um, as well as Android and iOS both support the cardboard SDK. So you can actually create um, your own custom implementations of VR. So I've also been exploring that as well. Um, if you want, you can check out my YouTube. I did an example of how to get um, Flutter web applications and Flutter Android applications running in the Oculus Quest. And it, um, it works super well. Um, and that's why I kind of wanted to do my talk on adaptive UI because, you know, this is going to be a future coming soon that, you know, your Flutter application with Flutter code can exist in a context that is beyond 2D but still in 2D form, if that makes sense. Like you're gonna have like curved menus and um, you're gonna still have elevation, but it's not gonna be like, yeah, it's gonna be hybrid. So something actually came up earlier. Uh, I think Tim tweeted someone did um, 3D in, in Flutter web. And they're using, yeah. uh, I think it was- uh, Box 2D, I think it is no, or something? Z, Z, Z job, Z box, something like that. Z box, um, yeah. Yeah, and basically it, 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 it takes a projection and then renders it as an SVG shapes. And then that's what you're actually displaying inside the browser. So it's not really, it's a 2D projection of 3D, right? It's not using any advanced sort of, as much as the browser is using the 3D acceleration of your graphics card, it's not really using 3D in that sense, right? You're not gonna get shaders in there. You're not gonna get fragment shaders and all this kind of fun stuff. Um, but I mean, like like last, last February, I put together an OpenGL in Flutter, right? I mean, you can do that right now. You can you can do those things, but you're going to be limited, right? It's not going to cross platform, right? Uh, you're going to have to implement any specific logic for Android or for iOS or for this or for that, right? But you can always project a texture into Flutter, right? So um, there's always ways of putting AR and VR and stuff into a Flutter app. If that's what you know people are asking, but. And the inverse, having the app run in a VR context too. Yep. One more thing, I'm just gonna post a question now. This is related to the future of Flutter as well. <laughs> it, it sounds like a good idea, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I would agree with that, yes. So this um, is one for Remy. I've got one here related to uh, sealed classes. Here we go. Remy, if you could comment on this. Um, <laughs> I, I know. You I mean, mean, that's not exactly a question, so it's difficult well, it's to, like, to say. Well, yes, it's a chance to promote something, possibly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, we can talk about the different packages available. Uh, I mean, I think you made one too, George. Actually, <laughs> I might uh, have bought it's... one. I didn't make it. <laughs> yeah. Far yeah. superior. It's more dart-like. <laughs> yeah. So I, I made a generator uh, for uh, CL classes. 
and data classes in general, uh, which, which, is, which is called phrased. So I think in my opinion, this in, the current syntax would be pretty close to what we would have when we have actual serial classes. So, so yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah, it's changed the way I've dealt with stuff because when you have immutability, you can really start to depend on what the data is going to be at any given time. I think that's also going to help once we get non nullable by default. I feel like that's going to direct I think so. instead of having null as a value, right? You're going to have um, mm -hmm. some property or you know so, some definition of what mm -hmm. nothing is for you for your like like you might have a a, a constant uh, none yeah. for a user and have a like user dot none and that's not null. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. Well, I came from like Swift and like that was kind of interesting that Dart still had the question, you know, optional chaining but it wasn't actually optional, you know, kind of types. And those are kind of weird to kind of get my head around because it's like, oh, well, it can be null, but it can also be set to null, but it's, yeah, it's a it's a weird thing. Like right, as it is right now. Oh, oh, it's, so someone's controlling these questions behind the scenes. I did not choose that one. Is there a good <laughs> learning path available for intermediate advanced flutter concepts like animation, state management, et cetera, basically creating a production ready app? um there's lots of resources uh for intermediate advanced i think there's lots of stuff around the the problem you've i think the problem with this question well sorry let me rephrase that that sounds a bit wrong the the, <laughs> the problem is it's not nothing to do with advanced you know intermediate advanced concepts like that they're all like state management right like i end up a lot of the time rolling my own i don't know i just feel like i don't need to use a certain library here or, or a package there right um i think i mean there's certain there's certain premises that you're going to get from understanding someone else's code and understanding your own code right so if you do it yourself you know what everything does and what it means whereas if you like i'm just going to pick this out there because remy's here but provider right then you need to understand how provider works right and what the inner workings are and how it does what it does so that you know if there's any bugs or not necessarily any bugs but um what the, the code path is right if that kind of makes sense and and i think it's just maybe learning resources uh it's a lot of community medium there's lots of posts there's lots of interesting resources i don't know um i'm sure that um there's actually quite a good good few youtube uh youtubers out there um robert burridge i know he's doing um, some great youtube videos on flutter Rody's doing his five minute Flutter videos. There's some good stuff going mm -hmm. on there. Um, I think. I mean, what? I mean, okay. So, so I'm going to ask this. Examples. One, I was going to say, yeah. yeah I was going to say, Matt, animations, right? Animations. I think is How one of the locks, right? Huh? How do those work? I know, right? What's an animation? I know. I, I've heard of this concept. Um, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw something out there now. Um, someone asked me. Um, about uh, page transitions. So I went ahead and threw together a little animation concept and I put that up on my gist um, on my GitHub. And it was a concept of of creating a custom animation object. So it's a page animation and it, and it listens to the page controller. This way you can drive any animation from your page controller. Does that kind of make sense? Right. So it ends up acting like an animation controller in that sense. And you can get some really advanced things. And I think this is the power of Flutter brings, right? Like one of the very early concepts you learn when you're doing animations is listeners, right? Everything is a listener. So you've got like scrolling, uh, pages. Uh, I mean, everything extends that listener base class. So you can just end up linking everything together and have everything react nicely for animations, right? I don't know. I there's, there's lots of reading material out there. Maybe we should... Uh, Put some more stuff together, I guess. <laughs> well, I I may have some things coming out in the coming weeks. We'll see. Nice. Mm. Is there another question? <laughs> I don't know who's controlling this. I think George is controlling the stream now. No. Oh. Mm. Who wants to take this one? Uh, yeah, I'll bring up. Uh, um, sorry, who's? Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, we had actually an issue with one of our clients um, where uh, it was a bug related to the keyboard, 
appearing uh, on the screen, the on-screen software keyboard, and that doesn't exist in widget tests. Uh, so widget tests run headlessly and they don't have the concept of a keyboard. So um, there you go. There's there's exactly you know one place now. Simon, did you want to say something? Well, I was going to say, could could you not um, sort of make a sort of a test harness which just uh, resets the the uh, dark window the, viewing sets to simulate a, where a keyboard would appear? Yeah, you could, but uh, it wouldn't have uh, fixed it in this case. So in this case, uh, I think you know. So th there are different kinds of tests, right? So the, the Flutter driver test, you know, gives you the ability to test on real devices. Or emulated devices, um, and that means you're testing, you know, things like the, the software keyboard. You're testing um, actual integrations with your backend, right? Like so, like that. That's that's an important part of all this, right? Is like how the backend does the backend work the way that your app expects it to, right? So, all the unit tests and widget tests in the world aren't going to catch the fact that you know uh, something broke on the backend. So, a Flutter driver test that actually is an end-to-end -end test gives you a lot of value. Um, and yeah, they're 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 slow and they're flaky, but you know, again, it's part of that whole uh, triangle, right? There's like a pyramid of, of, of tests, and there's a place for unit tests, a place for widget tests, and there's also a place for end-to-end end-to-end uh, end tests. Uh, so yeah. it's ne it's never black and white, right? It's always like what you're trying to optimize for and what mix of testing can get you there. At the same time, um, I think uh, the future of driver test is. Uh, I mean, in the driver test in their in their current test, to be honest, I don't necessarily like them. I don't like the API involved. I think the API for widget tests is a lot nicer. But uh, I think the team is working on a package to improve driver tests to make them as widget tests, which is called EE. Yeah. And and so the idea is basically to uh, be able to uh, run widget tests on a device, so it would be technically an end-to-end -end test. So I think that would be the ideal scenario, because we all know that widget tests are so powerful compared to what we have with driver test. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's called E to E, uh, E, the number two E. Um, the only thing is they don't, I guess I, it says iOS support is not available yet. So yeah, I don't know, is, that, if that's, is that accurate? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Also, I think there needs to be support for like, um, I've been talking with Norbert about this, like how we need, there needs to be a testing recording um, aspect to Flutter tests as well. Um, iOS, and I believe Android has this too, where you can click record, tap around your application, and it actually generates the code for you to do all the uh, the selectors. Oh, like the Expresso tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, where, where it will actually, you can, you can basically set up, go here, do this, do this, do this, and it would save though that as a repeatable set of yes. uh, mm -hmm. actions to take, and then you get your test, your expected test response from that. So if it breaks after that, you know that it's failed its input. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I it's mean, important because like it'll, we need to be able to make testing ten times easier. It's so already maybe, pretty easy, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's that's your next weekend project right there. I was gonna say, yeah, that's <laughs> right. a, a reasonable uh, thing to build. Yeah. It's convenient. I brought it up. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if we if we have uh, E2E working on all platforms, then we could technically use Golden Files combined with uh, the driver test together to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, what we got here? Oh, look, what are your thoughts on Flutter as a PWA? Um, Pretty great. You get some cross origin requests if you. Or not careful. So, uh, if you're trying to do webby things, yeah. What was I doing the other day? I was trying to. Um, I was loading an image, and I had to get the image dimensions right. So, Flutter Web itself, when you load an image, even though it's loading with this image provider, it's actually using an image tag under the hood and downloading the image through that, right? Using JavaScript, using the asynchronous loading behavior. So you don't, even though it's essentially cached by the browser so you reload it up next time it's there you kind of get all that behavior that you would normally get from the back end of of, um, of flutter you don't actually get the expected behavior when you request for that normally so if i make the request for an image then i'm going to get course header of problems right because i'm making it not the browser's making it right so there's kind of an interesting um sort of shift in the, in the way that you sort of expect things but i mean i think that's where I think we want the framework to evolve 
to, to sort of cope with these different sort of backing uh, platforms rather than lowest common denominator, right? I mean, if we if we if we say, oh, you can't do these requests or you can't do this thing because you're on web, it's not really like the appropriate response. I don't think you kind of want to yeah. flutter to evolve them to, to handle those different scenarios. I think. Or at least have extensions that can, yeah, because that's yeah, that's important. Um, Martin, if, oh, there we go. What do you think should be improved in Flutter? Um, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but this is the thing, right? Like, I, I think I mentioned this the other day uh, to someone. It was like using Flutter every day. You find those like those niggly points. I think the other one I. One I kept coming up with the other day is really simple one. Um, ra uh, Border Radius has uh, a, a circular uh, named constructor. I think it's a named factory, and it's not constant. So it just it's one of those things. That just just every single time you use it, now I have to switch it out for uh, Border Radius dot all radius circular. It's just a different. It's the same code. Just now you can has a constant path through the. You know, and I think there's always little things that you come across that that shouldn't be a problem, but it is. Have you ever? Uh, here's one for you, Rody. I've got one for you. Have mm -hmm. you ever wanted to lay out a widget relative to the child size? So imagine that you've got. Um, uh, I'll give an example. This came across. I came across the other day. Um, a panel. I had a panel that I want to size itself intrinsically, right? And it has to pop up on the screen, right? But I want that to be aligned to the top of another widget, right? But I want mm. it to naturally align itself based using the the layout system. I, what I don't want to do is have to start having to do things like oh, calculate an offset, set that offset, you know, and then have to track that. So when the keyboard comes up or when something happens, it has to I have to track the position again. Or you know, obviously you can do the composite layout bounds, but I just feel like this this notion of like having a widget yeah. align. Um, have you? Well, I think uh, Remy's worked on this too. Like, you know, um, the concept of like, you know, overlay 2.0, like that's a huge thing that needs to be added. Yeah. Same for Navigator 2.0. Those two things I think are just easy wins right now that would really help. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've played with it with a library I made called Flutter Portal, which is basically React portals re-implemented in Flutter. And uh, one of the things I did inside as a library is to kind of expand on some of the widgets built in Flutter, mainly um, composite uh, target follower, I think, to make yeah, it yeah. Uh, done automatically for you so that you don't have to specify the offset manually. And it may be interesting to merge uh, these utilities directly in Flutter. I think it would be useful. I think there's, I think there's definitely some some definite improvements that can be made too. I mean, one that I'm going to bring this up because it's just another that happened to be this way. Have you guys ever tried to use custom multi-child layout? I have, yeah. but I ended up backing out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see the point <laughs> of that widget to be honest. Everyone I've asked right ends up saying I tried it and it, and it didn't end up solving my problem. And the, and the reason for it was it's so, it, it cannot be sized by its child, right? So you can't have like a stack can size itself to its children, right? So if you had to Position like this it size itself to the minimum area of those children right? or natural size. Uh, um, custom multi child layout is really powerful, very handy when you want to compose and uh, do some. Uh, I'll give you a good example like your adaptive dialogue, Rowley, that you showed earlier, right? The fact that you've got mm -hmm. the layout in there and you're checking those bounds and you're switching out which widget to use, you can actually do that kind of thing in the you know, uh, render system, you know, in the layout system, actually choose which one to lay out and how you and how you position it and, and do all that kind of stuff however to do that you've got to do so much code you know for the render object side is it, is it worth it you know versus, right if i could just oh. do a widget with a with that delegate callback for custom watch child layout then that'd be worth it but it needs to size to its children right you, there needs to be the option to say i want to choose the size yeah and i'm facing that too yeah. right now with my my canvas as well because it's the same kind of thing the opposite problem I need to have a scale and an offset, and both of those things are really hard when you're when you start doing transforms and stuff. Like that starts adding padding, and there's just a bunch of like edge cases. But yeah, I've been thinking of uh, an, uh, a way to solve this recently, uh, which was um, the main reason we uh, custom design layout cannot depend on the size of the children. Uh, 
is because um, it would be too complex to do so. Um, that's what they said. I've got a patch um, for it. <laughs> that yeah. makes it work. <laughs> but I think I think one of one of the interesting solution to kind of simplify the pattern would be to have something like similar to uh, layer builder, but which takes a list of builders such that uh, such, that, such that it builds them in order, and then the next callback receives the size of all the previous instance, and then you could, you know, uh, so you know, build something that compose itself into. I mean, essentially that. So, so that the custom, the the callback in the perform layout callback in in, in the custom delegate for for um, custom multi-child layout, uh, you have to lay out all the widgets, right? There, there's there's uh, uh, there's code in there for, for checking that, right? But then it does the get size from your delegate before doing the layout. It is, literally is doing choosing to do it afterwards, and then the get size goes to your delegate, and your delegate gets to return the size. So you would have known in your delegate that you've laid out whatever widgets, wherever the positions are, and you can make that choice inside the, your layout logic to know what size you should be returning. I mean, truthfully, like let it be like layout. Return the size from your your layout function. You know, make it simple. I don't know. I just it's yeah, it irks me. <laughs> well, I think I think what we're all saying is that make it easier to do complex layouts, right? I think is is the yeah. of Flutter, right? Like, yeah, and and it, Flutter's layout engine is is very simple and very performant, but it does kind of introduce some challenges, right? And uh, I and support for like server side hosted too, like be able to like dynamically render a layout based on input. I think that's really cool too. Like uh, I'm basically having to rebuild all of that from scratch because it doesn't exist. Being able to like load in a JSON file or a file and have it just render a set of Flutter widgets like I that. Think, I think you know it's it's probably easy to to actually do that at this time in in terms of like, but it's the amount of boilerplate you'd have to do to make it link right. the, the the tags in your JSON to the widgets, right? Where I feel like the one thing that we got we lost in I think it was Dart one that had constructor references because you had to hash pound, you had to pound symbol uh, and we lost that with the upgrade set to Dart two it got removed at some point from Dart right um, and now you can't reference constructors that you know you, unless you, you use have, reflectable but it has to use code generation so yeah right. nothing at runtime so so constructor referencing would be you know that sort of solver to to doing sort of generated layout and generate content where you can have code that references the constructor objects. All right, be awesome. I'm I'm sorry. We'd love to carry on. Oh. Maybe we can next time. Yeah, maybe it's a regular thing. There you go. As well, it's getting late over here now, and uh, a lot of places in Europe are start. Is I'm getting messages that it's getting quite late, and numbers are dropping quite quite substantially now. So let's start closing off. I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers who actually attended tonight. Attended virtually, shall we say? It's really, really good. Really enjoyed this. And uh, definitely, we should try and organize more international meetups like this. Maybe New York can team up with Flutter London next time. What do you say, Martin? Love it. Yeah, do that. So I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, thank you for everybody who, came, who attended virtually online as well. Uh, appreciate your questions. And um, we'll see you next soon. Time. Next time. Yeah. All right. Thank you very Don't much. Don't forget to like, right. comment, and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I get to say it. <laughs> See you later. All right. See you Bye. later. Bye. Bye. Bye.